quite a long time earlier today and have been able to talk to her. Oh, there she is right there, in fact, although that might be video. Uh, so she basically now says she's kind of redefining what we talked about yesterday, and that is that was a 6.4. Now it's considered a four shock. So a foreshock, like an aftershock, it yes. comes before the main yes. event. Yes, yes. So now this is being called the main event. This uh, being a six point nine. So the six point four yesterday was a foreshock, foreshock to, to this. what just happened right now. So that is the main event, unless there's another event that's even more powerful. Let's hope so, that's not the case. Uh, but it's on the same fault in the same area, according to her. So that's that's basically how they start to define what has been happening. So that was a foreshock. Uh, we saw a number of other foreshocks. And this is the event. Right. Uh, let's go to Josh Hos Haskell before we lose him. Uh, Josh, where are you? And tell us what um, what you felt. Yeah, I just gotten home in West Hollywood, and I was actually in Ridgecrest all day yesterday covering. And I just cannot uh, stop thinking about knowing what the conditions are there. And I know that they had spent all day yesterday just trying to get back into their homes and get power on and clean up the stores because so much infrastructure was really out of commission all day. And now that they're dealing with an even bigger quake, that's what I'm thinking about. But here in the West Hollywood, Hollywood area, uh, it just felt I didn't even actually feel the quake yesterday. And I was in the same area. But the one today, we definitely felt that we're on the fifth floor of an apartment building. And it felt like it was shaking for almost 40 seconds. Uh, and we just went into the doorway, my wife and I, and uh, now just kind of trying to assess everything. And obviously, it's David, Giovanna, as you guys have been reporting, trying to get information out of Ridgecrest and, and other parts that are closer to this epicenter. Right. Uh, yeah. And then again, so we were starting to talk about this, that the length of shaking, and I, and I got to talk to Lucy Jones about that earlier today. I was telling her my observation yesterday was that as I was sitting there in the parade and I was on these rafters, so I was a little bit more sensitive to what the crowd was feeling. And I felt several seconds of shaking and movement, which told me, and I haven't even said this on the air, I felt that this must be a really powerful quake. It was probably a long way away, but the fact that the ground was moving for, for so long gives you some indication of the strength of the earthquake. She agreed with that assessment. And to give you some idea, if you were sitting under the epicenter, in Northridge, which was also a 6.9, when that struck in 1994, they said basically the ground sh shook, but severely shook for nine seconds. It might have been extended further out that you go, but nine seconds. Compare that to, let's say, a 9.0 that hit Japan in mm -hmm. 2011, mm -hmm. in March of 2011. Depending on where you were in Japan, the ground shook for three to six minutes. Wow. That's why that was such a devastating earthquake, and it caused a huge tsunami, which we all saw. Right. And, and uh, it, it is a different type of fault line. Um, but the ground shaking and the length of time the ground shakes gives you an indication of how powerful that quake was. Uh, Mark and Josh both felt that ground shaking for quite some time. Right. And that gave us some idea that this is a really strong yeah. And I'm hearing from, from Playa Vista, um, from Playa Vista, uh, friends were at, at the movies. At first, everyone sat during the first 10 to 15 seconds, and then the quake kept going. It didn't stop, and then everyone apparently stood up and very orderly walked out of the Spider-Man screening there. Uh, this was at the Cinemark in Playa Vista, and uh, they gave people passes to return, obviously, but uh, for those who wanted it. But uh, Hal Kenfer, uh, he's checking in. He's our, our security expert. He's saying that he felt in Long Beach for a little bit, a little bit less than a minute. So, but still, a minute—that's a, a tremendously that's long, a long time. time. That earth, is a long time. When it comes to earthquakes, it, that's that's moving. You just uh, hold your breath, and you're just holding, waiting to, you know, to see when it'll stop. We have Veronica Miracle on the line. She felt it in Big Bear. Um, Veronica, can you describe it for us? Well, Giovanna and David, it was so intense. So it started off kind of like we're looking around like, okay, is this an earthquake? And then it really started shaking. We're in a cabin that's elevated on uh, pilings, so kind of like stilts. And we could see and feel the cabin just moving back and forth and creaking the wood. And so all of us, I'm with my siblings, we kind of went into the bathroom area because it's a two-story cabin and there's like a lot of open space. Um, but all of the frames on the walls were shaking back and forth. And then in the last, I would say, 20 minutes, we felt about three or four aftershocks. Mm -hmm. So it's been really actually kind of terrifying. 
Right, and it, and it gives you the extent, an idea of the extent of how many people are affected by this so one and the increase in power. So you're up there in Big Bear. How, how long did you it say the, the, did the you feel the, the rumbling and the shaking was? Okay, we have Lucy Jones. Los Angeles area. Let's listen in to uh, okay. My expectation is that Ridgecrest is having a pretty difficult time tonight. Um, it is a four shop. Oh, man becomes bigger than the main shock, we change the name and call the first one a four shock. So everything up before the 7.1 would be a considered a four shock to this earthquake. This is an earthquake sequence. It will be ongoing. It is clearly a very energetic system se sequence. So we there's no reason to think that we can't have more large earthquakes. The largest aftershock on average to a 7.1 would be about a magnitude six. So another magnitude six similar to uh, yesterday's earthquake in size would be um, not surprising to anybody. Uh, at this point, we don't have a lot more information. You can see on the map over here where the locations of the earthquake and aftershock are. The blue are all earthquakes that happened before the 7.1, uh, the last 24 hours. Um, and so you can see this basically happened at the end of the zone that had moved previously. We're now seeing a few earthquakes way up to the northwest, so we know the fault's extending at least that far. It may very well come all the way back down to where the 6.4 was. We can guess at the size, the length of the fault from the magnitude. A 7.1 is going to be 40, 50 kilometers, something like 25, 30 miles long. And what we're seeing between the main shock and those ones up to the northwest is about 15 miles. So probably it involved the lower part too. Okay, and just to add very briefly, uh, actually when this earthquake occurred, we were on a call with the geologists uh, from the U.S. Geological Survey and California Geological Survey who were out in the field. And so they are going to go out and start looking and seeing what actually happened to the ground. The earthquake that we had yesterday did cause some surface rupture. I would highly expect that the earthquake we had tonight is also going to break up to the ground surface. So we will be getting information from them hopefully later this evening and we'll relay that information to you folks as we can. Can you talk about the All sequence right. ongoing? So sequence ongoing, typically how long is that ongoing? A magnitude seven usually has aftershocks that last for years. Yeah, so the expectation is we're going to have aftershocks tonight. It's going to continue on. We will uh, continue, uh, or we'll come back in about 30 minutes as we get some more information and have a chance to analyze the data. Thank you very much. How much bigger is a 6 point, is a 7.1 than a 6.4? What's the logarithm of, of 0.7? Uh, it's about 10 times. Yeah. Good. <laughs> yes. And that's the time to stop. We're gonna, that's the information we have right now. We have a magnitude in the location. Hopefully we'll have a bit more soon. More questions, guys. We're gonna, we're gonna come back at 930. We're gonna come back at 930. 7 one is still the number. 7 magnitude, yes. Okay, okay, we're getting uh, conflicting information. Er, initially, that strong quake at 819 was reported as a magnitude 7.1. Then we heard reports that it was downsized to a 6.9, rather 6.9. And now we're hearing from Lucy Jones. She's referring to it as a 7.1. So we're going to try to get some clarification for you on that. But at this point, Lucy Jones is considering that a 7.1. And what was interesting, what I thought was very interesting, she called this an energetic sequence. She's saying that another another magnitude six quake would not be surprising, mm -hmm. and we could get several more. Right. Usually, uh, the the uh, aftershock w could is often uh, as powerful, uh, not as powerful, but it's a little less powerful because it could be very close to as powerful right. as the main earthquake. And right. we, we've seen that a number of times. When I went to Japan after the 9.0, we got hit with a 7.1 while I was there. Um, and it, it's, that's really, really strong, and that's just simply an aftershock. Right. The other thing she said that was interesting, she said the 6.4, many people felt that 6.4 yesterday. This one today, the 7.1, is 10 times stronger than that mm -hmm. 6.4. So she mentioned the folks in Ridgecrest having a difficult time tonight. I can't imagine, uh, and I'm sure we're sending crews out there to, to see what the damage is, but uh, I can't imagine 
they must be just on edge and another, very tense at this point. Another thing to consider, and this was uh, the case in Haiti, and Haiti is especially bad because of their infrastructure and the way they build their buildings, not nearly as good as they, we do here in the United States, but with every aftershock or, or maybe main shock like in this case, when a building is compromised, if the ground shakes again, mm -hmm. it puts, it makes those buildings more compromised or even brings them down. So if there's older structures, if there's mobile homes, you know, we, we showed you throughout the day today a number of mobile homes that had extensive damage from the foundation mm -hmm. or just collapsed. And then if, if there are others out there that are already compromised from the 6.4, right. then whatever happened tonight, they could, they could go down. Yeah. It's one of the reasons why during an energetic event like we just are feeling right now, as Lucy Jones described it, they want you to stay out of buildings, especially buildings that are showing cracks or some challenges to the ground shaking, because exactly. if you're in those buildings and the ground shakes again, they could come down on you. Right. Another she reason did. why so many people ran to the streets and slept in the streets in right. Haiti after the earthquake. Right. Uh, they did mention that because Ridgecrest was built in the 1940s, that some of those uh, structures at least had some earthquake protection. Right. So there was that. But that is a good point you're bringing up tonight, that the fact that they've... Okay, okay, yeah, retrofitting, th thanks to retrofitting, yes. things are, are, are better, better and can handle this. But it's a good point that yeah. after it, several quakes, the, the buildings become more fragile. They're, they're still vulnerable to going down. Absolutely. Okay, we have a few people to get to. Um, I'm sorry, Carver. Leticia, Leticia, Leticia Waters, Waters is standing by right now. Yes. Leticia, where are you? Um, actually, I'm in my home in Riverside. Um, you know, I've got a little exmitis in my ear, so if they can take me down a bit. Um, so I can tell you, I just interviewed a gentleman from Trona. He's somebody I met yesterday, uh, David Surlis. He was telling me, with, along with pictures that he was sending me, about just some of the damage that he was seeing in Trona, uh, toppled uh, brick, uh, brick fences okay, and we, big... We have, I'm sorry, Leticia. We have lights moving in our studio right now. And I'm wondering if we just got hit with another major aftershock. We're going we're gonna to look into this. I didn't mean to interrupt you, but we're, we're hearing yeah. our lights moving around. I just want to put, put that out there, folks. If you're feeling something, let us know. Okay, Leticia, uh, carry on. No problem. So I was speaking with a gentleman from Trona who I met yesterday. He's sending me pictures, and he says right now residents are fleeing Trona. There's a line on uh, State Route 178 of people just heading out of town. They've lost power after getting it back yesterday. And he says the intense shaking has really scared folks. Uh, he sent me a really good picture of the road that buckled, actually, on the 178 Toronto Road. Is that right the at one? the railroad track. Hopefully we can get those pictures up to you soon. Uh, but he says that people are, at this moment, a line of cars just fleeing Trona to get out of the area after that intense earthquake. Let's Forgive me, see, uh, uh, Yeah, we can't, uh, are you saying Corona or Trona? Trona, Trona, Trona. Okay, and that is in the Ridgecrest area? Yeah, it's a town about maybe eight or 11 miles away. Okay, and did you, are you referring to the Highway 178? Is that the one that, that was repaired very quickly, about within an hour yeah. after that crack appeared? That's the one you're talking yeah, exactly. about? Exactly. Okay, and Got that's it. damaged again? Yeah, damaged again, but instead of like a line across the road, this one is around the center divider. You see the center divider, half of it is down. So there is an uneven, um, like one tops, one's up, and the other's down. Well, that's, that's... And I apologize that my voice is choppy, but I'm hearing myself in the ear as I'm talking to you. Right, it's okay. But th that's valuable information. And Trona, T-R-O-N-A, it, it is a town that is uh, in that valley there that was affected by yesterday's earthquake. And then as Leticia just revealed, severely affected today. So we've got to look into that. Um, and thank you so much for Leticia for, for giving us some, some more information on, on what you're hearing. And of course, uh, uh, stay with us and, and let us know how what else you find out out there. Uh, we, we're going to go to Miriam Hernandez right now and Miriam where are you oh there you are you are you are live okay Miriam, yes. hi. Okay, Dr. Lucy Jones just spoke here along with uh, Dr. Rob Graves about what we have experienced here. Some quakes still happening as we speak. We've been watching on the uh, shake alert map as they roll through. What she told us is that the latest quake, the latest large quake was a 7.1. That's the data that they've analyzed, 7.1. And that apparently is the main shock at this point that the other shaker that we felt yesterday, 6. 
6.4, that that was apparently a foreshock. They spoke at length about the calculations and the, the possibility that the that there could be a larger shake. Well, that certainly has happened. How much bigger is a 7.1 than a 6.4 logarithmically? Well, Dr. Jones says that is about 10 times stronger. So exceptionally high. A very uncomfortable night for the people in the Owens Valley. You can see up there on the map the uh, dots. Those red ones are the ones that have happened in the last hour. And they do extend in a different pattern than the ones that we saw uh, previously. All those that uh, blue cluster, one over the other, um, those were from from a, a, a day ago. But now we see that that area stretch. She says that the, the fault now appears to be longer than originally thought um, by several several kilometers. There is um, going to be another briefing ahead, but I'm going to see if I can corral one of these other seismologists and tell us. Um, can you tell me anything about more, anything more about the fault where this this activity occurred? Um, Dr. Jones was pointing to. Oh, our map went away. Um, she wanted to put the. We're working on the map here. We've got. Well, um, the, la the latest, the latest, uh, the latest quake, the latest uh, tremor. Um, can you tell us about these? What we're seeing here? Um, yeah. yeah, we'll look at a better map for you. Uh, can, you can you show the fault map again? We're going to show the fault map again. Just stand by. Miriam, can you hear us? Can Miriam hear? Yes, us? I can. We're just, we're, ju we're just, we're doing this. Yes, I can no, hear I, you. I understand. No, I know you're waiting for something, but can you also, uh, at some point, inquire about the early warning system? I know that there were some questions uh, after yesterday's quake, uh, it not being in place or the app not working, um, but. Can you get some no, clarification? No, the app on that? was working. The app was working. The, yes, yes. The yeah, the app was working. Uh, initially, it appeared that people did not get an alert, and that it may have been the fault of the system. It was not a fault. That's exactly what was supposed to happen. The the map was triggered. The alert was triggered, but it is designed with certain thresholds. Those thresholds uh, prevent unnecessary alerts for lower level movement. Uh, that would not create any damage in LA County. So they don't want people alerted for damage when nothing's going to happen. The tremors that were felt yesterday were not big enough to cause damage in Los Angeles County. So that is why, oh no, go ahead, Dr. Jones. Dr. Jones is back. So we're gonna go and uh, wait for her to update us. More, okay. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll go ahead and start up again. Okay, we just lost our signal. We'll try to get that back. Yes. But I, I think there is tremendous activity going on right now, Giovanna. Uh, they're feeling uh, things okay, moving so, again in the booth. Uh, Let's listen in. We're still getting the very beginning of the information, and we're finding our system's pretty overloaded. Uh, I think an important thing up here is the shake map that's just been shown. So we had a magnitude 7.1. Uh, it's just about an hour, well, 50 minutes ago. And uh, can we go back to the shake map? Um, where is it? The, um, yeah, okay, here. Notice that there's red areas. That's implying a quite high shaking intensity. Intensity is different than magnitude. There's one number to represent the size of the earthquake. Yesterday, the biggest was a 6.4. Today, the biggest is a 7.1. Intensity is what you feel. So we have here a map of what the shaking intensities were up around the Ridgecrest area. Notice that they are going into red. That is intensity 9. The 6.4, we only got up into orange. Intensity 8 had been the maximum. So this was definitely stronger shaking. And unfortunately, it looks to be uh, uh, the pretty high levels of shaking there in Ridgecrest. Um, 4.6, OK. Uh, how far was this from the main from the shock yesterday? Um, the, all right, so the, remember earthquakes don't happen at points. So, all right, they're planes. The 6.4 actually seemed to have happened on two planes. All right, let's go back to the, um, uh, yeah, thanks. Oh, hard to see it now, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Um, 
it, there, there was a, there's a northwest striking surface and there is a southwest striking surface. This one, as what we can tell at this point, it looks like it happened on the northwest striking feature because we saw several, uh, notice the, the red boxes the, the, up at the northwest corner of the big box. That's showing us aftershocks happening northwest of the main shock, and that implies that's the direction that the fault went. Um, here we're seeing it a little, uh, yeah, we, well, we're still struggling to get up a good figure. Right. Um, uh, but the, the epicenter of the 7.1 in relation to 6.4. Okay, the epicenter of the 7.1 is at the northwest end of the fault that moved in the 6.4. Now the 5.4 aftershock this morning extended that fault. What we saw from the main shock, from the the force, from the 6.4, the 5.4 extended it a bit to the northwest, and this 7.1 seems to have extended it even farther to the northwest. So the fault is growing. We ruptured a piece in the first earthquake. We ruptured a bit more on the 5.4 this morning, and we're rupturing more now. Uh, it is moving towards the northwest, uh, away from the metropolitan area, as far as we can tell. And a 5% chance this will go even further. Right. Every, it's, this is another earthquake. Everyone has a chance. Um, it, I'm trying to think if we've ever seen a situation with a 6.4 or 7 and then something even bigger, and I can't think of one. Um, not that it isn't possible, but I, I can't give you an example where it's happened before. Um, say in, a uh, we've had uh, four shocks to a lot of other earthquakes, the Landers earthquake, the, which is a 7.3. Two months earlier, there was a 6.1 called the Joshua Tree earthquake. That's a far enough apart that we don't usually use the word four shock, we call it a pre-shock. There was a 3.8 a couple of hours before the 7.3. Uh, in 1987, the Superstition Hills earthquake, 6.6, .6, was preceded the day before by a 6.2. So this is, that's why we keep on saying one in 20 chance. Well, this is the 20, the Lucy, one. can you talk about the 6.4 yesterday and how it relates to the 7.1, which was the main quake, which is the breach? Okay. By definition, because the 7.1 is the largest, we give it the name main shock. So yesterday or an hour ago, we were calling the 6.4 the main shock. It has now had an aftershock that's bigger than itself, and so we changed the name. And the so 6.4 is now a foreshock, and that really large aftershock has become the main shock. Um, as far as we can tell, those names, foreshock, main shock, aftershock, are semantic. There are tools for trying to describe what's going on. But when you have a sequence going on, every earthquake makes another earthquake more likely. And that's what we're seeing right here. And you're already having aftershocks. Can you talk about how many, how big? Uh, well, all right. So just look right down here on the lower part. Since the 7.1, we are only seeing basically the fours and fives showing up. We've had uh, one, two, three. About 10. It's uh, 5.7. Oh, oh, 5.7. <laughs> okay, so we have an earthquake that's already begun up north, just slightly to the northwest of the main shock. Our early warning system is saying 5.7 with 26 seconds till it gets here. The one that was a 5, 4.9, we felt. So this, assuming that the magnitude isn't really misestimated, my guess will be we'll feel this as it comes through. In about in about 12, 12 10, 10 or 10, 10, 10 seconds. And do we expect this magnitude of aftershocks throughout the rest of the evening? Well, yeah, the largest aftershock is likely to be a six. Well, let's wait, here we go. We should here be we feeling go. it now. Can you guys use a user? What's the TLC number? Huh? There it is. There it is. <laughs> there it is. Feel it? Yeah. yeah. That was the phone ringing. <laughs> that was less than I saw. I felt from the one that was labeled as yeah. 4.9. So, <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. So clearly, we're a long ways away from the earthquake. We're still. Can we feel it? Remember that the people in Ridgecrest are going through a lot worse than this. We already had damaged houses and um, structure fires out of the first earthquake. Uh, this is going to have been more intense shaking. Okay. This came through just as a 3.5. And Lucy, yeah, is it all on the same fault line as the 6.4? Well, yes, the same fault system. It does appear to have multiple strands to it. We've already seen the two perpendicular ones. Um, I think it got the 
the magnitude. The magnitude wrong, because yeah, uh, unless it hasn't come through yet. So, um, so, Dr. Jones, can you explain the shake alert again? Because some people just got the initial report that it quote unquote wasn't working. Um, can okay. Can you explain again that there? Let, let's let uh, the USGS handle that one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so the system worked. Oh, that was a 5.1. Yeah, okay. yeah. So uh, the system, the ShakeAlert system worked both on the USGS side and on the ShakeAlert LA side. The reason why alerts or notifications didn't go out to LA County is that the threshold for shaking was set above what the estimated shaking would be. So uh, it was just the way that the system was designed. And in fact, the same thing happened again tonight. My understanding, uh, the alerts did not go out on, on ShakeAlert LA. The a magnitude that was estimated with the uh, early warning system was 6.2. So the initial magnitude estimate was too low. Consequently, the intensities were below that threshold. So the, the system is not perfect, but again, what was experienced here in Pasadena, LA area, these were not damaging ground motions. What's going on up in Ridgecrest, th those are damaging ground motions. So th those folks are really feeling it. Hey, Robert, what's the chance of another large quake like this or even larger tonight? Uh, well, as Dr. Jones had said, there's a 5% there's a chance uh, that this could be followed by an even larger quake. This and or well, that's that. The number of five percent is usually for a few days. The most yeah. likely time is within a day, which is what, of course, we we just saw what thirty hours or something, thirty-six hours. Yeah, and, and, and in said fact, earlier that you don't recall of any size of earthquakes sequence where the seven point one was followed by a greater earthquake. Oh no, no, I just don't remember one that's had this in California that's had that series. There are places elsewhere in the world. There was a magnitude eight and a half that was a foreshock to a nine and a half in Chile. So there is nothing about the magnitude that says it can't be a foreshock. Right, but in California, along this, in, in, in the seismicity of this state, you've never seen anything follow a 7-1. Uh, boy. Yeah, but that doesn't mean... We have it, no, 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 we have in Nevada. We have in Nevada yeah. the Fairfield earthquakes. Yeah. yeah. The, 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 ta the takeaway here, though, is that as we have just seen between yesterday and today, quakes that we say our main shocks can actually be four shocks to larger quakes. So And we won't know till it does or doesn't happen. Yeah, right. yeah, there there's a is small percentage. One the same depth um, for the most part is the six four? Yeah. Well it's seventeen kilometers. Yeah, so it's so. the epicenter is a little bit deeper. Uh, we, we do have geologists out in the field. We haven't got reports back, but they'll be able to go but out and, and said, document. But also remember. Miles. You said five to 10 miles? So that's the 10 it's miles, 10. right? It's 10 miles down, whereas the one yesterday was more like six or seven miles down. Um, however, a bigger earthquake also involves a larger fault, so it still may very well. I, probably this is coming to the surface. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know. Is there. Uh, what you're really worried about is, are we going to trigger something outside of this region? Right. Probably not. Okay. Why? Because it's, we're too far away. The ability to trigger another earthquake is very spatially defined. So the most likely place to trigger it is at the same lo on the same fault. As you go away with distance, it becomes much less likely. How far is that from the San Andreas? Uh, it's quite a ways. Quite a ways. We, you know, it's not even on that figure. It's a, it's over a hundred miles to the San Andreas from from this location. And the Garlock. The Garlock Fault is a lot closer. Yeah. And and the Garlock Fault is another long fault. If we were going to be triggering something really big, the Garlock might be a source for it. This is sort of like when landers happen near the San Andreas. And we said, oh, if we're going to set off something bigger, there's only the San Andreas around. Of course, it didn't happen. But it was a possibility, a low probability possibility. The Garlock, luckily, really runs through some of the most isolated parts of California. You said yesterday yeah. there were two faults making this L pattern. So there was that lower little leg. Right. And now the top part, that's the part that's extended. It's the northwest right. part that's extended and grown, whereas the, the, north, the, the southwest striking one. You want me to? doesn't seem to have had more earthquakes. Is that a surprise at all to you, that this fault system was capable of this kind of earthquake? No. Uh, there was a magnitude 7.5 in 1872 in the Owens Valley. Uh, there have been lots of sixes. There's this whole series. When I said Nevada, 
1915 and 1954, and I don't have the magnitudes in my head this time, but they were sevens, uh, there were series of earthquakes with several events within them of six to seven. Uh, in Mammoth in 1980, there were four magnitude six and a halfs that happened in one sequence over about 10 days. This part of California is characterized by these type of, of groups of earthquakes that there might be a, several that end up larger. The first one is often not the biggest one. Knowing that which one is the biggest one means waiting till we see that we aren't getting another one. When was the last time we had something sizable on Garla? Not in the historic Pre record. Yeah, prehistoric. Prehistoric. This is extending about 25 miles, you said earlier? Uh, that's an approximate guess off of looking at these figures, which are having trouble coming up. <laughs> the northwestern um, fault, is that the one that's moving into China Lake? Uh, the, the southwest striking one is the one that goes sort of from China Lake down to Ridgecrest. The northwest is going up through the, the China Lake uh, Navy so this base. One, I, I know that there has been trouble trying to get geologists onto base. Have you guys made any progress on that? Yeah, yeah actually, uh, our geologists have contacted the Navy and are able to get on the base with some limited access. Now, that was prior to tonight's event. So. Presumably, uh, well, I would, I would expect that there may be further damage on the naval base. Uh, we don't know yet. I haven't gotten reports. But my suspicion is that the geologists are going to be able to get out there very quickly and look at potential yeah, okay. rupture. But, uh, the other uh, comment here, just following on what Dr. Jones was saying, when we have events that uh, where a, a main shock then becomes a force shock, typically the triggering is relatively close and that's actually what we saw here these two earthquakes are very relatively closely located so the triggering typically does not happen at, at a great distance more typically it's, it's close by i can't think of any example where we've seen this type of foreshock triggering that isn't within just a matter of a few kilometers i mean the famous widespread one was elmore ranch and, and superstition hills a 6.2 that was on a uh, southwest striking fault and then set off a 6.6 .6 on a northwest striking fault, sort of like this. Uh, the epicenter of Elmore Ranch was up here, but the fault extended right down to the Superstition Hills. And what we were seeing aftershocks pounding at the Superstition Hills fault up until the time that the earthquake happened, the, the main shock happened. And we've got a similar situation here where we've had aftershocks along this fault. We had, and then we had the 5.4 breaking through a bit towards the northwest, and now we've had it again. Um, and we now see more aftershocks up to the very northwest end. And chances are we stop now. It's possible that we'll continue to extend up to the northwest. Right. You said for a 7.1 magnitude quake, you could expect an aftershock sequence that lasts for over a year. Yes. All right. So the 7.3 Landers earthquake, the last magnitude 5 to that 1992 earthquake happened in 1998, so six years after the main shock. We should be expecting to record earthquakes here for a long time. Can you describe that terrain of where this aftershock was, or whether this main, where this main shock was? Uh, it, well, the terrain is, is, is very isolated. It's desert, um, not a lot of population. So uh, actually, in, in a sense, for being able to get people out there and look at it, 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 it there's a good opportunity. Uh, and also, because it's not densely populated, uh, the chance of having damage to structures and, and injuries is, is much lower. Uh, but it is still very, you know, it's hard rock. These are faults that are breaking through hard rock. That's why they create these waves that we feel strongly, even down here in, in Los there Angeles. We there we go. Now we There's one the, more, actually. Can we do? Or? Yeah, we're now getting okay. some of our okay. graphics up. So, okay. Lucy, if you want to describe yeah. this, and I can kind of point. And, and right. Everything. So the blue means it happened more than an hour ago, but less than 24 hours ago. You can actually see some yellow underneath because we're more than 24 hours since the main shock. But all those blue dots are the aftershocks over the last 24 hours, and that's uh, the red ones are within the last hour. So the main shock has already turned blue, it's actually uh, right. and that's right there. Uh, the main, sh the epicenter of the 6.4 was basically at that corner, and we think ruptured, well, clearly ruptured to the southwest, probably also some rupture to the northwest in the same event, maybe in the aftershocks afterwards. Then the 5.4 aftershock was, uh, the one this morning was located right in there, moved the fault a little farther, 
Then we have the seven. And now look at that cluster up to the northwest. We think, you know, right now we, we aren't getting many of our aftershocks recording yet. The system's pretty strung out. And um, uh, so we're pretty sure that that is a continuous aftershock zone. And that would mean that's the extent of the fault. Yeah, so the, yeah, and, just right, and just the length of the fault a magnitude 7.1, we would expect that it's probably at least about 25 miles long. And that would imply probably that whole length from where the 6.4 happened up to where those aftershocks are up in the corner. And is this China Lake up there? This is. Where the red is? Yeah, so the. Okay. Naval oh yeah, right. The naval air ba uh, the naval air station is that whole area. So this is all within the naval air station. Uh, this there's a fault system. So we see all these little faults on the on the uh, ground. Rather than naming each little piece separately, it's been called the Little Lake Fault System. And so that's you know these are. So the length of the fault itself has been defined by the 7.1 earthquake. No. No, it could. We don't. No. You, you don't know it. It's, yeah. Right. And if you look to, I mean, look at the mapping that we can see there. And we, one of the things we can do if we got a bit of a break and <clears throat> found some stuff, we could pull out. <laughs> um, we'll, give you a soon. Uh, we'll try to get out the state geology map and really see the detailed mapping that's been done in here beforehand. But notice that there's this little string of. Do you see where the the cursor's showing you all those little faults going up to the northwest? And uh, they, it was not mapped as a through-going fault. It was little pieces up through here and now we have more little pieces farther up so no we can't say oh the faults used up it would uh, but most likely if we were to see more going on i would be much i would think it more likely that we're heading to the northwest than turning around and coming to the south again so the the, the surface rupture how close would that be to the epicenter i mean are they tied together they are the same, like the epicenter is only the place where the fault started to move. It is not the location of the earthquake. The earthquake happens over the whole fault surface. And just like if I were gonna try to t tear this, I, I can't do this, what I would do is I'd start a tear here and then rip down this way. And that's, this would be the epicenter, this would be the fault surface. The earthquake's happening over this whole fault. So, uh, we think that what's happening here is a fault about 25 miles long. We started at the end, the part that hadn't broken before the 7.1. Potentially, it ruptured in both directions. About 80% of earthquakes are unilateral rupture in one direction, and about 20% rupture in both directions. So on the 178, there was a left lateral slip of about six inches. Could we expect that to grow? Uh, that's actually the left lateral one is down on the north on the southwest striking fault. So so down here, and it's not at all clear that that part has moved in this in the 7.1. So yeah. do you know what kind of earthquake it was yet? And what do you mean by kind of earthquake? It's a strike slip. It's strike slip. It's strike slip. Yeah, that's something that we can get from the. Um, uh, seismic records and it's very clearly strikes them. Yeah, and and just to follow on with that, the event yesterday was left lateral strike slip, which actually released some uh, compression on what we think is the fault that ruptured this evening in the 7.1. This event presumably is a right lateral strike slip, um, with a, but basically motion horizontally. And again, with this magnitude and this length, the expectation of having surface rupture is much, much greater. And by being able to go out and actually measure that, they, you know, in a 7.1, I'm trying to think back for landers, there was up to, uh, I don't know, 10 feet of displacement. 18 feet was the maximum displacement so, in the seven landers. 18 feet of displacement. Meaning that if the fault way. ran between you and me, mm -hmm. right now we're looking at each other, after the earthquake, I would be 18 feet farther yeah. down there. Yeah. yeah. There was a school of thought a while ago that the seismicity of the state was moving straight up, as opposed oh. to San Andreas, and you had landers, you had Hector Mine, now you have this. Does this add to that academic dis debate. Uh, right, that debate was not on human time scales. That was saying we were moving over there in the next few million years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but, but, and actually, let me, let, me, let me turn that around a little bit. I think these events are a reminder that we can have earthquakes anywhere in Southern California. Uh, you, you know, it's, it, it, and on a human time frame, as Dr. Jones is explaining, an event 
like today's could occur in the LA Basin. It could uh, occur down south in the San Diego area. That's just because we live in an area that has many, many active faults. Right, but if you have an earthquake fault, the earthquake of 7.1 magnitude, 150 miles away from a major metropolitan area, and you suffer damage here, you're in big trouble. Because oh, you, you, was there damage in the Los Angeles well, I, area? No, my, my point is we get calls and oh, we ask yeah. for it. And, and there, there's a report of a power outage or somewhere. The region has to sustain a 7.1 150 miles away. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> and, and, and I think for the most part, the region has. I, I think the incidences are probably somewhat isolated. I would, I would be very surprised if there was much widespread impact in the Los Angeles area. But clearly up in, near the epicentral region, the Rich Crest area, you know, those, those folks are having to deal with a lot right now. We haven't gotten any direct reports here, but I'm sure there's lots of damage and they are probably uh, dealing with aftershocks as well. And we're waiting to hear from your geologists. What information will they provide? Well, they're going to be out in the field uh, as soon as they can and as best they can. Obviously, it's nighttime right now. They may be limited. This is uh, uh, the, the Naval Air Weapons Station, okay? So there's, uh, you know, unexploded ordnance issues. Uh, they may not be able to get out there at night. When they get out there, they'll have to be escorted. Uh, that all those logistics are something they're going to determine. But, but there. what they're looking for is finding a fault where we find that motion that's happened. Because we are seeing, with our seismometers, we say, we see these waves coming off of here and we calculate back, they're probably coming off of the surface. When we get those field geology, it's like this fault has moved. And so it's uh, to. Is it's ground truth. We know and, that the and, Navy and is testing munitions out there. Is there any chance at all no. that anything underground from the Navy may have triggered any of this? No. Look, at, we've set off pretty large nuclear blasts without ever setting off an earthquake. The largest earthquake, I think, set off by the largest nuclear blast yeah. is like a magnitude and, 2. And the hypocenter for this one is, is down at 10 miles beneath the surface. Is so. there anything about this earthquake that's surprising at all to you? The size. <laughs> well, uh, no, in a way. Yeah. I mean, you know, as Dr. Jones was explaining yesterday after the 6.4, there was a possibility of having a larger event. And sure enough, we did. And, you know, the, the mechanics of these two faults, the conjugate faulting, actually makes a lot of sense in, in, in a, from a geologic or scientific perspective. So I would say, no, there's not really any surprises that we've seen so what far. What you learn from it? Well, hopefully, uh, number one, learn a little bit more about how earthquakes work. Number two, I think, uh, you know, there's teams out there looking at damage, how buildings responded. Every earthquake is a chance to learn what worked, what didn't work, and make improvements. And obviously, a better understanding of earthquake triggering. Hopefully, we'll be able within this, because we have, uh, you know, I can go and rattle off all these previous earthquakes where we've seen one trigger the other. The recordings we have of those earthquakes are primitive compared to what we have now, and we don't really know all of what the mechanisms were in this earthquake. With the system that we put in place to do early warning, we now have hundreds and hundreds of stations that are out there giving us much clearer pictures of what's going on on the fault. So now we're going to be able to see exact, in, with much greater resolution than we've had in the past, what part of which fault moved and how did the pattern progress and start and and of course there's always the hope that we'll find something that's different about the four shocks yeah and let me just but add we haven't uh, I, let me let me just add in terms of learning the shake alert system which has been put in place in the, in the last few years and is constantly being tested this is an excellent test case for that system we'll be able in the in the coming days be able to analyze how the system performed does it are, are improvements required I, I suspect yes maybe in terms of estimating the magnitude so that's another point where we'll be able to build on this event and make some progress i'm seeing a report from usgs that this uh, fault is so shallow, it was technically above ground, listed as a like oh. sign on a violent mortality intensity scale. What is that? Not something coming from a scientist? Yeah, uh, I don't yeah. know if that, I, I doubt that's coming from the USGS. So earthquakes obviously cannot occur above ground. Um, <laughs>
Yeah. 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 All right. There are some times where our location might show up as being a negative depth, and that means something went wrong in how we located it. Yeah. The depth is actually much harder to construct. All right. All right. We lost that signal. We, 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 we gleaned some fantastic information from oh, Dr. Jones. Okay, let's see if... The depth of this earthquake is similar to what you've seen before, historically, in this region. Yes. The, in, in this region, we've had somewhat deeper faults. Uh, this, the area is... Uh, you know, that, that idea of, you know, redirecting the San Andreas, we are seeing this area opening up. It is what the geologists call the basin and range system. So you have the big fault that's on the side of the Sierra Nevada, and then we have the faults that are forming all of the different ranges that go out through Nevada, all the way out to the Wasatch in Utah. So everything between the Wasatch and here is called the basin and range. So it's an area with lots of faults that's spreading out and some of them happen by faults that move up and down and some of them happen by these horizontal ones sort of squeezing out along the way and the rate at which they happen summed up as about 10 to 20 percent the rate of what we see on the San Andreas and the sort of the, the the geological discussion is that because it's going to eventually take over from the San Andreas or is that yep. some other sort of uh, millions yeah. of years right yeah. not on our time scale but it's still this is we, we sometimes call this a complex plate boundary. Two-thirds of the motion happens on the San Andreas. The rest of it gets smeared out through other faults. And this is the 10 to 20 percent that's smeared out to the east. Well, you said the Wasatch, but do we see these kind of events in Utah? Or in yeah. Well, uh, the farther west east you go, the less frequent they are. But we're pretty sure there are magnitude sevens under the Salt Lake City, about once every thousand years. Um, and here in along through this region, it's all, as I said, I think 1915 and 1954 and 1872 were all at close to magnitude seven coming up through somewhere between here and up to Reno. Okay, about five more questions. Yeah. Can you talk a little uh, bit about a question it. about the conjugate system here? The fact that these two are conjoined, does that add any energy to it's just a uh, happenstance that these well, two are connected? As far as we can tell, actually, the more we, s the better picture we get of the earthquakes as we put in more instruments, the more often we see multiple faults in the events. We think they probably really were, most of them are like this, that we're just finally being able to resolve it. Yeah, yeah. The, actually, the way we just uh, describe that is earthquakes were a lot simpler when we had less data. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, <laughs> and we're back in that 5% zone again since this hit, correct? Correct. Well, yeah. Every Generally earthquake speak. every earthquake has that 5% chance type of level uh, of being a foreshock. And the fact that it had foreshocks doesn't, as far as we can tell, really change that probability. You said before we, we, should ex we should be able to provide an update on those aftershock probabilities within the next hour or so as the data from this 7.1 is analyzed. Okay. So for now, 5% is kind of the ballpark figure. Right. It might go up a little bit if we see a lot. No, the only thing I was trying to say was that we don't get the sevens very often. When's the last time you were a seven? The same time, last time we had a six. The last earthquake we had above six was a 7.1 hectare mine in 1999, so 20 years ago. Um, with your hands, could you show what a left lateral stri slip strike looks like? Okay, strike slip means that you slip along the strike. So the strike gives you the orientation of the fault. If you're slipping parallel to that, it's horizontal. It, the opposite is dip slip, where you're slipping in the direction of the dip of the fault. So strike slip, if we move, let me see. I, I do my thumbs, I go like this, I now have to, on this side, I have to step to the right to find the rest of my thumb. But if I went here, I also would have to step to the right. So one stays still. So that's right, so, well, no, they both, it's, that's all relative. Yeah. They move with respect to each other. And if they move like this, it's right lateral. If they move like this, it's left lateral. And that's San Andreas as well, strike slip. The San Andreas is strike slip, right lateral. Northridge wasn't. Northridge was a dip slip, moving up the fault, growing the mountains. So in general, the faults are, the, a lot of the, many parts of California, we see this strike slip motion. And what it's leading to is a, a gradually extending of it. It isn't pushing us up or pushing us down, but it is sort of moving sideways and stretching out parts of the fault, of the state. Yesterday, you guys talked about a little bit about, uh, you know, the lack of, a, there was basically been in a drought period for, 
uh, right. major earthquakes. Does this sort of confirm that, affirm that, or do you guys see it opening up it's, to a it's, new normal of some sort? All right, this earthquake is still only one sequence. And so the fact that we've had the 7 after the 6.4 does not change. This is one sequence in that uh, thing. We just, in geology, you know, we can look at the geology. We can look at the long-term pattern. We know that we need to have an earthquake of at least six or bigger every three to five years in Southern California. It's been 20. This, this, this 20 years without any can't be the long-term normal, just because geology shows us we need more than that. Okay, last question. In terms of the damage, that could be expected in places like Trona and Ridgeway. Can you just talk more generally about how much more susceptible these buildings are coming just one day after? That's going to be an issue that the building that was damaged in the first earthquake is then weaker and more likely to, to sustain damage in this earthquake. So, um, uh, but that's completely hypothetical at this point. You really need to get the engineers on the ground. There were engineers, I, I saw stuff today that the engineers were getting out there to inspect the buildings. Uh, hopefully they'll, they'll be there tomorrow. Is there any description that you were able to get from the engineers or from the, the field teams yesterday about what they observed, anything else? I, just some brief reports. There was a, a call earlier tonight. Uh, for example, there was a hospital that had been inspected and actually was found to be structurally okay. That was after the 6.4. So the engineers are there, and they have looked at some buildings. You know, clearly they're going to be looking at, at, at the, either the same buildings or other buildings now. Um, but it's too early uh, for any of that information to come back. And remember that any, uh, both the geologists and the engineers are physically looking at things, and it's a lot more difficult to do at night. Yeah. Okay. I think we're, we're going to. Or you can find out more about the aftershock sequence. Yeah. yeah. So, so we're going to. We, we need some time to, to kind of look at the data that's come in. We'll have a briefing again uh, shortly. Okay. Hopefully. Thank you. Well, by 10:30, we hope, because I'd like yeah. to go home. And, well. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thank you. Right. Dr. Jones is at a really long day. We interviewed her here at the studio earlier today, and she has been making her rounds all over Southern California, talking about yesterday's event, and then this one eclipses that. But we did glean, uh, New Giovanna, information. some really great yes. information. Uh, mm -hmm. Number one, uh, she did uh, reiterate that it's unlikely that what's going on up there will affect any fault lines down here. That it will not trigger a quake yeah. in, in any faults outside of the Ridgecrest area. The, the thing to keep in mind, and she always says this, is there's no such thing as a, a, as a set rule, but there's likelihoods, and, there, and it's less likely that that's going to trigger something down here. That's, that's right. important. There's a 5% chance that we could still get yet another quake that's even stronger than the 7.1 from this fault system. Right. So oh. that, that exists. One in 20 but a 5% chance. And also, did you find that interesting when we got the quake alert system? We actually got to watch it work with that was, them. That was so fantastic yeah. because they told us in 26 seconds we're going to have a 5.7 uh -huh. magnitude quake. You could watch the countdown. It was a 5.7. It said it was a 5.7 aftershock. That magnitude is in question. That right. was not confirmed. But we saw the waves moving and moving, and we saw the countdown. When that countdown hit them, it also hit us, and our lights started shaking. We could see the lights shaking here in the studio. That Extremely was amazing. And again, accurate. Lucy Jones immediately was saying that didn't quite feel like a 5.7. It's coming out as a 3.5. Mm -hmm. So that part of it is still in question. Yeah. But the fact that we watched the countdown for 26 seconds and then at zero, we saw the lights move in here. That was really fantastic. And that's why that is vitally important as we get better at, at predicting, or not predicting earthquakes. I'm sorry I even said that, mm -hmm. but but give, doing this alerting. early warnings, yeah. is alerting people that the waves are coming. We we shut down trains, et cetera, anything that could be damaged um, extensively from those waves that are heading our way, very important technology. Right, and then we should point out that these are the largest quakes that Southern California has had in 20 years, so these are very significant. Authorities are now reporting uh, some injuries and damage from this big quake, uh, that, and it was felt not only here in Southern California, but also in Vegas, as we have heard throughout the night, and even in Mexico as well. Los Angeles Fire Department, though, this is good news that they have searched the city. This is L.A. City Fire Department, and they said that they have not found any significant damage, so they're downgrading their alert back to normal. That's in the Los Angeles area. It doesn't necessarily mean outside of these areas that, as we've already reported, that there are some damage and injuries.
and live pictures from Air 7 as it flies over Southern California. We are trying to get confirmation of a couple of places that might have some power outages. outages. Stay tuned for that. We'll try to give you some verification on right. that. Right. And I want to go back to earlier we spoke to Leticia Juarez, and she was telling us that she had a... a sp uh, interviewed someone from Trona, and this is the area that's 8 to 11 miles away from the epicenter, right. from Ridgecrest, and that people were fleeing on uh, Highway mm -hmm. 178. And you might have seen earlier reports, uh, the picture of the highway, Highway 178 had that big crack in the road, and um, Caltrans moved in very quickly and within an hour or two had repaired it. She was saying that same highway was uh, had suffered damage, but this time it was a center divider and that there was a significant crack. Right, so a lot of concern about Ridgecrest. Ridgecrest. So we have somebody on the phone from Ridgecrest right now. His name is Chris. Chris, can you can you describe what you went through and how are you doing? Uh, yes, sir. Um, I was walking down my hallway uh, when the big plate started shaking, and um, it was going from the north to the south first for a few seconds. And then it changed in which came from the east to the west, which, and it was it was uh, strong enough that I had to actually hang on to the wall to stay on my feet. You had to, you had to actually hold the walls to stay on your feet, which shows that it was significant. How does this compare to what you felt yesterday? Uh, it was much much stronger. Do you know of any damage that you received or your community has received? What, what is the reaction, if you know of it, uh, of your neighbors, et cetera? Um, we're used to having earthquakes around here frequently. On the satellite image you show on your screen, you notice the mountains are dark around the valley here. Uh, that's because they're volcanic. And uh, there's a geothermal and north of uh, Ridgecrest. So we feel like 3.0 earthquake pretty regularly. People aren't generally worried about that. This was a real attention getter. Right. You're saying this one was a real attention getter. It was stronger than, than most? Yes. Yes, indeed. Um, and and um, you may have answered uh, the this. The Navy oh, does oh. testing on here, and we hear explosions pretty frequently, but... Uh, don't worry much about it. Uh, I'm sorry, did you say that you have heard explosions, but you don't worry about it, but you heard some tonight? Is that correct? No, no, no. Uh, the nature of the testing they do at the China Lake Deep, uh, we hear odd things. Uh, we just don't worry about uh, odd, but uh, this earthquake uh, was the strong. I remember ever spelling my whole life. I understand okay. what you're saying, but you you're, you say that because of the naval base is there, there could be some uh, uh, explosions, etc. It's kind of normal for you to hear these things being so close to a military base. But uh, I tell you yes. what, it cannot be work on the base. Right, Got it. what they're doing on the base. So that's I, what I he's understand. trying to clarify. We're, we're so sorry. The connection is a little bit difficult. But I think most importantly, uh, have you heard from members of your community? Are you guys doing okay over there? Because there's so much concern. You, you just sat through a 7.1 earthquake that will damage any community in, in uh, the United States significantly. Um, most of the dwellings in the valley are single story. Uh, and uh, a lot of them are from the 60s newer, so they're up to more recent old. Uh, the biggest concern here in the valley is that our wells are going dry because your aqueduct is taking all our uh, water recharge from the Owens Valley. Okay, I, I, I'm so sorry. Our connection is just not very good. And I, I know you mentioned the aqueduct. What is your concern again with the aqueduct? Well, the, this Indian Wells Valley that has the naval base and a, a city with 1,000 people, our wells are drying up because Los Angeles is taking all our recharged water. 
Okay, water right. issues and, and, yes. and structural and, and a town uh, with a thousand people, yes. Right, okay, thank All you. Right. Chris, hold on 30, the phone. 30,000. Oh, 30,000 30, people. people, wow, yeah. okay. Uh, we have to say thank you to you because we know you, you held on, thank on the you phone for, your for time so long. And, uh, you're too professional. Right. Really appreciate you. Thank you, you we bet. hope you're safe out there. Thank yeah. you. Um, so, so Let, much information to get to right yes. now. Uh, right, right now we want to go to Sid. He's at the Americana here in Glendale, and apparently many, many people felt it there. Sid, what are you hearing? What can you share with us? Uh, there's a rattle. Let me bring in Aaron Johnson. You were at work when it happened. Where were you, and what did it feel like when it hit? I was at a CPK in Glendale, and it's a large building, like uh, almost like a pseudo high rise. And so the building did exactly what it was supposed to do. It started swaying, you know, back and forth, but it was really disorienting, you know. And I remember I kind of got down into a leg lunge, just wondering what was going on. What did you guys do as far as the staff and then the customers that were in the restaurant at the time? Did you evacuate or just? No, we didn't evacuate. I mean, it wasn't it wasn't that extreme, but I mean, nonetheless, it was. It was unsettling, and so we all just kind of, kind of made sure everyone was okay. We went to the guests, made sure that they were okay, and then just, and you know, then just subsequently, we just kind of went, went out, you know, went through the night. When you see how busy it is, and after what happened earlier today, is it kind of like okay? For about 10, 15 seconds, it was scary, but now it's time to move on. Actually, that's exactly what it was. I mean, it, we, it was. It was that exact moment where we, we all realized, like, okay, well, that was, that it's over and done now. It's time to keep moving forward. All right, Aaron, I appreciate you standing by. And that's been pretty much the sentiment from people we've spoken to here today. They felt it. It was kind of a rolling motion. But now, let's just get back to going back to dinner. Or as one guy told us, I'm late for a movie. Reporting live in Glendale, I'm Sid Garcia, ABC7 Eyewitness News. Send it back to you. All right, Sid, thank you. Those are good words that you're, the person you spoke to uh, used, uh, disoriented, unsettling. I think we can all say that that it, was the case for us. It's interesting because this quake was so powerful, it's really extended. If you, if you can envision where Ridgecrest is, and that is basically if you, if you know where L.A. is and Las Vegas is, Ridgecrest would complete the triangle. And so it's in that area of the desert where it it could hit Fresno, Vegas, Southern California, and obviously Bakersfield. Mm -hmm. But all of these communities are feeling it. So we're getting reports like Carrie Skillman, uh, our entertainment producer with George Benacchio, she said her parents felt it all the way down in way south Orange County significantly. Yeah. So folks are feeling it everywhere. Well, we've heard reports in Las Vegas. We know that the, the game, uh, the sports was interrupted well, exactly. in Las Vegas. Um, the summer and league. We're hearing reports in Mexico. Uh, so right. this, this is, yeah. Definitely felt uh, throughout uh, a very, very vast area. Uh -huh. So we are uh, also going to hear now from Eileen, um, Eileen Frere. She is in Buena Park. Eileen, what can you tell us? Well, Giovanna, uh, likewise, here in Orange County, we've run into so many people that felt this huge quake. Here in Buena Park, especially, we have Hassan Patch. You were home with your mom when this uh, hit. And what did it feel like? Uh, it was very, I don't want to say calming but it was much like a wave uh, like you're on a boat ride uh, it's very different from what we usually felt before where we get these sudden jolts so uh, after the earthquake it was just I felt a little nauseous I'm, I know a lot of other friends they also felt nauseous as well just because it was so long and uh, swaying back and forth how long do you think it lasted and you said you felt one and then a second one yeah uh, the first one was it was kind of you know quick and then all of a sudden we started getting it constantly. I would say maybe it was about 45 to one minute. Uh, and what was going through your mind when this was happening? At first, when I felt a small one, I was thinking nothing of it. But then after the second one hit and it was kept going and going, uh, then my mother and I definitely jumped up, uh, made sure we got into a safe area uh, just in case a big one did come. Uh, so we were getting prepared for that. And you did feel the one yesterday here in Buena Park as well. Did, maybe to compare them. Uh, yesterday's was definitely not as bad as today's. Um, so today's was definitely much, much more worse. And you said things in your house, you could see stuff moving and... Yeah, we could definitely see things shaking. Uh, and that's why I was kind of worried because after I started seeing more things shake compared to what it was yesterday, uh, we wanted to definitely make sure we were safe uh, and make sure we had cover. So yeah. And where did you go? Uh, I go under the door so and then hold both sides just to grab uh, to be safe. And any damage at your place? Uh, no, no damage at all. 
Now, you were talking, you've had some friends um, texting you as well. Um, maybe tell me, some in San Diego, you said, uh, told you that they felt it? Yeah, I have some friends in San Diego uh, who said they felt the quake. Uh, a few friends in San Francisco, they said they didn't feel nothing at all. So um, I know San Francisco's, San Francisco is pretty far, so uh, they probably wouldn't have felt it. But definitely people in like San Diego felt it. And you were saying, too, that you are prepared in case the big one were to hit or in, in case there were, was damage uh, where you might have to be out on your own? Yeah, definitely. We do have uh, a lot of water bottles, uh, you know, instant noodles, spam, things like that. Uh, anything that's non-perishable that will last quite a while. Uh, and then we do try to rotate it out every few years to make sure everything is still fresh. Right, and that's what everybody should be doing. And, and I think with these earthquakes, it's really bringing it home to to uh, go ahead and do that just as a precaution. You've been doing it even before yesterday's quake, though. Yeah, definitely. We've done it for years because, again, we live in California, so we know there's earthquakes. So you never know what you can expect. So it's always better safe than sorry. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Hassan. Thank you for waiting, and thanks for speaking with with us and sharing that. And uh, we're here live in Buena Park. Eileen Frere, ABC 7 Eyewitness News. We'll send it back to you. All right. All right. Eileen Freer, thank you very much. Uh, Mark Brown now joining Giovanna. And uh, what a day it has been here in Southern California. Indeed. The second day, the second earthquake. I apologize for my lack of tie. I was off today. I was actually at Dodger Stadium. You were at the Dodger. You felt it there. Hit. Uh, we can talk about that a little later. We have Jory Rand right now. He is live in Valencia. He can tell us what uh, things are, are doing at the moment there. Jory. Yeah, and we're at Valencia Town Center, and if uh, there's another briefing, you can interrupt us, just let us know. We're at the movie theater here where uh, a lot of people were inside when the movie struck. There was no official evacuation, but some people, many with small kids, got up during the middle of whatever movie they were seeing and came out here. Oftentimes, uh, many of them did not come back. So we are here with Kyle Dylan Lucas. Kyle's actually the son of our sports producer, Dave Brill. <laughs> Kyle, uh, what was it like inside the theater? Um, well, just like a couple days ago, everything just started to sway and we immediately realized it was an earthquake and so did everybody else and the whole theater just began to like get up and walk out of the theater and there wasn't anyone like screaming or anything but it was honestly just surreal like um, we stayed in the theater but there was this huge fan ahead of us that, or above us that was just swaying and like it was just it was kind of scary but yeah, it sounds like it. So there was no screaming, but I'm sure people started talking and, and yeah, shouting. Yeah, like at least half the theater got up and walked out of the theater. It was, and then eventually everyone started to come back, but there was still a bunch of more empty seats than there was before the earthquake uh, hit. Anything from management about uh, whether to leave, whether people would get their um, refunds if they well, left? Well, since we didn't leave the theater, we didn't really hear much. You know, we just kind of like finished up the movie and walked back out. But okay, so yeah. you're you're probably too young to have experienced Northridge. <laughs> no, probably yeah. weren't alive at the point. What has this been like for these last two days to go through uh, earthquakes this size? Um, it's just been like an interesting experience. Nobody's been hurt that I've been around, obviously, with in this area. So it's more just been like, like a, a weird, you know, experience to feel what an earthquake was like, and hopefully not another big earthquake hits like the one in Northridge, because I've heard stories about yeah. you know, how bad that one was. All right. Well, appreciate it. Enjoy the rest of your Friday night. Thanks so much. Glad uh, everything has turned out okay. We're going to take a little walk, guys. Uh, over here, there is a group of uh, uh, folks eating dinner, and one of their daughters was actually in the theater at the time. We'll put them on the spot right now. Guys, can we talk about what happened? Can we talk about what happened during the uh, sure. during the earthquake? What you guys felt? Were you here? We yeah. were here. Yeah. Here. These these umbrellas were like swaying back and forth, and I thought he was like tap. Shaking tapping the table. his leg and shaking yeah. the table and Mike stop it and he's like no it's an earthquake and we just wrote it out and it was kind of fun yeah, and you said your daughter is in the she, theater she's in, in the, the movie movies theater. right now yeah actually and I think yeah. they evacuated the theater and and then they got them out and put them back in. Did, yeah. did she texted you? What yeah. was happening? What did she say? Yeah, she, she asked us if we were okay. Yeah. And uh, we said we're fine. And she said, okay, we're going back in. And so that's where we're at now. So it sounds like she might have been more concerned than she was more concerned concern about us than we were with her. Because, I mean, she's 200 feet away. So we were okay. We figured she was okay. So. Yeah. Okay. What has this been like to go through? Uh, uh, were you guys here for the North Ridge quake? And yeah, it's been kind of fun because it was more like rolly, like you're on a boat. And it's kind of just rolly rather than that intense shaking. Yeah. So it's a little bit fun. I never felt ever that we were in danger, right? No, we were and then we were here yesterday um, in the area, the same thing. It just felt kind of fun, kind of rolly, and at no point did I feel like 
like we're in danger, like that okay. intense Did shaking. You, you guys know this is a seven one. Yeah, we looked. Yeah, up. yeah. 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 The worse, the worse than yesterday. It so, feel yeah. like it went on for a really long it was a time. Bit today. Right. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Well, everyone's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone's safe. Yeah, Good to hear. Safe. All right. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Appreciate. It. Yeah. We we first headed this way. We saw some posts on Twitter about uh, mass evacuations outside movie theaters in the area. This one was not one of those. But again, many people left the theater at the time. We heard that big fan inside was was swinging during it. But it seems like everybody here is okay, and we'll uh, continue to talk to folks and check back in a little bit. But for now, we're live in Valencia. Jory Rand, ABC7 Eyewitness News. All right, Jory, thank you for that. And we're going to check in with Scott Reif. He is in Air 7 HD, and he is flying over SoCal. Scott, what do you see? I know you're looking for damage. And uh, Mark, you know, initially we got airborne out of Van Nuys Airport and L.A. City Fire was up, L.A. County Fire was up. We came up into Santa Clarita. That would be a little closer, a little further north to actually to Ridgecrest. We're over Magic Mountain at the moment. We thought, well, you know, we've checked to see if maybe they suspended the rides. They have not. Uh, everything seems to be normal here. And the good news is as far as what we've seen, you know, there was a couple reported power outages in the San Fernando Valley. We tried to spot them. We really couldn't. So if there are some power outages, they're going to be pretty small. We haven't seen a lot of response uh, from the fire department or the police department, uh, L.A. County and L.A. City. They did land their helicopters. Uh, right now you see on Sky Map 7, once again, we're over Santa Clarita over the 5 freeway. And uh, the good news is, as far as what we're seeing right here, uh, is that we, we're not going to see much in the way of damage. We haven't seen uh, anything like that. So fantastic news. We wanted to get a little further north, but the weather conditions are such. There's a little bit of a haze layer out there, sort of restricts us from getting into Ridgecrest that far up into the desert uh, at night, but certainly good news from this vantage point as far as Los Angeles and Orange County and uh, uh, even Ventura County is concerned. We're not getting reports, and we would start to get those reports now uh, if we had, you know, fires or gas leaks or major responses, and uh, that is not the case in this area. So certainly we're fortunate, but my goodness, the folks in Ridgecrest must really be uh, unnerving for them. It's got to be extremely tough. All right, Scott Reif, thank you very much for that live report. As you continue to survey Southern California, we're going to continue to keep an eye on this and update you on what has happened so far this evening. A second day, another huge earthquake in Southern California, just to reset and let you know where we are. Uh, the first one at 816, a 5.0. Another earthquake, the big one at, 8 point, at 819. That was the 7.1 quake. And then a 4.7 at 822 p.m. being felt from as far away as Las Vegas all the way to the ocean and from as far south as San Diego up to Fresno and beyond. Uh, people all over experience it in, in, in different ways, mainly as a rolling motion, but uh, the reports are coming in now from all of those areas and now the damage is being surveyed throughout. There is some damage to the highway. It's 178 in that area. Is that correct, Javon? Yes, in Trona. In Trona, we are under, we are under uh, Leticia Juarez told us earlier that uh, Highway 178, uh, there was some damage on the center divider there. Uh, that was the same highway that we saw damage at yesterday right. and that the Caltrans repaired pretty quickly. That we are understanding is now um, also damaged again um, on the, in that area. Um, also, we're hearing from Leticia that people were fleeing uh, the Trona area, that there were reports of uh, lost power there as well. So a lot happening. We are going to continue to follow uh, the damage there and we're sending, we have crews on the way to Trona mm -hmm. and to Ridgecrest to get more information on that. But to to, to clarify a little bit more uh, on the uh, earthquake activity, uh, Lucy Jones uh, referred to it as an energetic sequence earlier mm -hmm. tonight when she was talking, uh, and she was saying that uh, it would not be surprising if we see aftershocks uh, in the magnitude 6 area. And we do know now, before we get to that, uh, one more thing to say, we have had 52 aftershocks since that 7.1 quake, and the largest was a 5.5. Let's hear now from Lucy Jones, who spoke earlier. By definition, because the 7.1 is the largest, we give it the name main shock. So yesterday or an hour ago, we were calling the 6.4 the main shock. It has now had an aftershock that's bigger than itself, and so we changed the name. And the so 6.4 is now a foreshock, and that really large aftershock has become the main shock. So the fault is growing. We ruptured a piece in the first earthquake. We ruptured a bit more in the 5.4 this morning, and we're rupturing more now. Uh, it is moving towards the northwest, so away from the metropolitan area, as far as we can tell. Okay. Trying to think if we've ever seen a situation with a 6.4 or 7, and then something even bigger, and I can't think of one. 
Um, not that it isn't possible, but I, I can't give you an example where it's happened before. What you're really worried about is, are we going to trigger something outside of this region? Right. Probably not. Okay. Why? Because it's, we're too far away. The ability to trigger another earthquake is very spatially defined. So the most likely place to trigger it is at the same look on the same fault. As you go away with distance, it becomes much less likely. How far is that from the San Andreas? Uh, it's quite a ways. Quite a ways. We, you know, it's not even on that figure. It's a, it's over a hundred miles to the San Andreas from from this location. The main shock is already turned blue, it's uh, right. and that's right there. Uh, the main, sh the epicenter of the 6.4 was basically at that corner, right, right. and we think ruptured. Well, clearly ruptured to the southwest, probably also some rupture to the northwest in the same event, maybe in the aftershocks afterwards. Then the 5.4 aftershock was, uh, the one this morning was located right in there, moved the fault a little farther. Then we have the seven. And now look at that cluster up to the northwest. We think, you know, right now we, we aren't getting many of our aftershocks recording yet. The system's pretty strung out. and. Um, uh, so we're pretty sure that that is a continuous aftershock zone, to, and that would mean that's the extent of the fault. All right, each one of those dots representing a whole lot of frayed nerves and uh, some damage as well. We know that things have fallen off shelves where we had some structural damage yesterday. We have reporters on the way to Toronto right now. Initial reports were that there were some fires that broke out in the Ridge, Ridgecrest and Trona areas. We're going to try to get more information on those. In the meantime, we have a Felicia from Ridgecrest who joins us now. Felicia? Hi. Hi. What, uh, where are you and what's your situation right now? I'm in Ridgecrest. Um, I was laying in bed watching TV, and the 5.0 occurred. Mm -hmm. I ran outside. My neighbors were there as well. Um, we were standing there talking, and then all of a sudden, the big one hit. We ran to the middle of our street, huddled together. Our cars were shaking and bouncing so high, I didn't know if they were going to come run us over. It was very scary. You sound like you're still pretty rattled by this, or how are you doing and are your friends doing right now? Um, we're okay. I'm currently at my friend's house. We pitched a tent outside, um, and I've also gone to, my, to a friend's house and checked on her dogs, and they're okay as well. Uh, Felicia, do you see any damage yes. in, the, in the area around you? Um, not in my area besides just fallen belongings. Um, I went to another neighborhood and didn't really see anything. Okay. But I'm constantly hearing alarms, fire trucks, the helicopter with the spotlight. And, and you said you pitched a tent outside. Are you and your friends yes. the only ones who are outside now? Or are there other Oh, no, other the people? street is lined with people. Really? So nobody wants to go back into their homes at this point? No, there's some people packing up an RV. Hmm. I was considering going home to my family in San Diego, but I don't know about the roads, um, and it's so dark. I don't want to get stuck somewhere. Um, is it, we heard reports of a power outage. Is, is there power there? Um, our street does have power. Mm -hmm. When the earthquake happened, our outside lights turned off but then came right back on okay um but it's just chaos outside what about water service or have there been any interruptions in your ability to to, to turn on the tap and get water no water's fine mm -hmm. um the neighborhood i'm in all of the people turned off their gas mm -hmm. and then are you hearing or seeing authorities at all is anyone coming through and telling you uh, you know what to do where to be anything like that um, I heard earlier people running down the street telling people to turn off their gas. When I went to check on the dogs, mm -hmm. I saw a lot of police presence everywhere. Um, other than that, I haven't heard anything else. And then tell us where you are, where you are uh, in Ridgecrest. Are you at all near Trona, and, or is that quite a ways away? Uh, Trona's pretty far away. Okay about 20 minutes away from where we are. Okay. Mm -hmm.
So are neighbors helping neighbors at this point, people banding like together, nine. or are, are people kind of hunkering down? What are, what are people doing kind of socially at this point? Uh, neighbors are talking to each other. Um, people have offered water. Um, pets are outside. Um, I, I had a coworker call me to offer to come sleep in their corral mm -hmm. in a tent on the other side of town. So people are reaching out okay. All right. and helping. Felicia, hang in there. We wish you well, okay? Yes, um, thank you so much. Okay, we're going to check in now uh, with uh, Kern County Fire. Uh, There's a news conference underway. Out Let's for listen. additional uh, police officers at other locations. We've gone into unified command in the city of Ridgecrest. And uh, we have a lot of people that are here to help. And uh, we're currently taking action. And like I said, uh, we're just gathering information right now and uh, taking action. So with that, we'll go ahead and uh, I'll open it up to questions. Well, can you actually put this mic right there really quickly? I apologize. Can, can you speak louder, Actually, please? before you take questions, we want to recognize a couple of folks who are here uh, coordinating with us. Um, so we have, and I'm going to step out of the way, Chief. Okay, uh, we have uh, Congressman McCarthy's office here, um, Assembly Fong, Shannon Grove's office, uh, Mick Gleason's office, as well as other supervisors across Kern County are here to assist this operation and given 100% support. And uh, we're putting together a plan right now. Okay, questions? What's the plan? The, the plan is to do a systematic search of Ridgecrest uh, for life and property and um, address those specific issues. Next. Have you um, had any reported injuries? Yeah, uh, there are a lot of uh, medical aid calls out there. We know of no fatalities at this time. However, uh, there have been a lot of uh, uh, ambulance calls, medical aid calls for help. Next. And I know there's crews there right now, but are you planning on sending any more resources, first responders? Yes, we're, uh, we're uh, launching a lot of people. A lot of people are headed from a lot of different places. Um, we have um, a, a strike team of engines that's just arriving from our county, as well as all of the local resources out in the desert are now in the Ridgecrest area. Next. What's the biggest concern? Well, the biggest, uh, you know, there's many concerns, many concerns. Uh, you know, we think of the dam, we think of uh, buildings collapsed, people trapped. Um, however, we don't have any reports right now of uh, major building collapses. However, there could be some, but uh, we're going to search, and that's, that's the first part. The first part is, is uh, finding out uh, where those buildings are and um, gathering that information. But there's so many calls for help that um, we have a, a backlog of calls in the Ridgecrest area. So that's, that's where we're at. Well, what was your initial reaction when you felt the quake as if you felt it based on what happened yesterday? Well, you know, uh, um, being here in Bakersfield on the uh, east side of town, uh, you know, feeling the, the earth move, of course, we're wondering where the epicenter was, where did it hit, find out the information. We found out it was a 7.1, realizing that that was uh, more significant than the one that was previous. Uh, we started launching a lot of equipment, um, even though we don't know for sure what all the damage is. Uh, we want more equipment because we know how uh, catastrophic the last one was. We were getting reports into our newsroom that there was a fire at the hospital. Can you confirm or deny? I uh, don't know about a fire at the hospital. Okay, would anybody else like to make a statement? No? Okay, any other questions? Uh, let's see, what time is it? It is. 10:30. All right, you're hearing from uh, the sheriff there at Kern County and uh, giving us an update as best he can. They are surveying the damage, a very systematic and detailed search. So far, they haven't found any significant or major injuries. They're getting reports of people needing medical aid. They have a backlog of calls that they are trying furiously right now to, to address. So they are expecting injuries. They've got no reports of any fatalities. This is different from the way things were at this time yesterday when they were talking about 
minor injuries, a couple of dozen calls for service. This is on an order of magnitude much larger, and the response, as you can imagine, is larger as well. There's mutual aid coming in from outside the county, different areas of the county, all over the state, coming in to Ridgecrest to help out to make sure that there are no collapsed buildings, making sure there are no people trapped in any buildings right now. They don't have a full assessment yet. They are trying to get that, but as of now, no reports of that sort of thing having happened. Right. The big, the big news and the best news that he reported is that there are no, no fatalities to, that he can uh, confirm, and he does not know anything about the earlier reports of fire at a hospital, at mm -hmm. the hospital there, so that is good. But again, you mentioned the backlog of calls. I would imagine it'd be very frustrating for them mm -hmm. to have to get to all of these people and, and feel like they need to do it in a timely way and not have the resources. They have the resources, mm -hmm. but getting it, getting out there and, uh, and handling it all. He talked about the major concerns being the dam and the buildings collapse that you mentioned mm -hmm. and uh, the possibility that people are trapped. But so far, there's no confirmation that any of that has happened. All right, and, and a reminder while we're here, while we're talking about that, while we're listening to him uh, responding is that you don't want to in, in, the, in the wake of an earthquake you don't call 911 and say hey there was just an earthquake they know there was just an earthquake so you call 911 if you're hurt if someone's life is in danger if there's a fire or a similar sort of situation don't clog up the 911 phone lines don't clog up the phone lines to for period if you can avoid it and certainly don't do it unless there's an absolute emergency that is taking place that you can see and report now um I guess we can we can talk well, about where. Well, I, oh, yeah, but before you get to that, uh, and I and I want to hear all about yes. that is the, the fact that uh, I just want to reiterate what Lucy Jones said earlier that the 6.4 quake yesterday is is now being considered a four shock. Mm -hmm. uh, so that that's important to know because um, we've we've now had 52 aftershocks mm -hmm. since that 77.1 quake that we had at uh, 819. Um, so and the possibility of having another significant quake, a six point magnitude six point is very real. Yeah. So now you this were, could be a long yeah. night. You were in your office when this happened. You were here I was in my office uh, at 816 when mm -hmm. that first 5.0 quake hit, and I think I was the only one in the building who felt it. I came out to the newsroom. I said, did you guys feel that? Am I crazy? <laughs> Which is what I think a lot of people think yeah. when you, you, you experience an earthquake. You're not quite sure. Is the building moving? Did I really feel that wall right. You know, or shake? Or am I, is my yeah. vertigo kicking in, which right. I happen to have right now? So, <laughs> so that, that happened. And then as we're talking, was there a quake? We started to see uh, social media, you know, light up with mm -hmm. people reporting that 5.0. And then we felt collectively, all of us in the newsroom, the 819, and we could really feel, we could see uh, whatever was hanging from the mm -hmm. ceiling shake, and we could feel the building shake. And it did feel like it went on for several seconds, 20 mm -hmm. seconds, 25 seconds. And, and, it's, and you, you go through, your, you're thinking, when will this stop? Is it going to stop? Mm -hmm. How long will it, you know what I mean? Yeah. You just... You start wondering. You start is this wondering, it? is this going to be that minute long or yeah. two minute long quake? Two minute long quake that yeah. could uh, er erase the building that you're in. That's right. Uh, I was at the Dodger game. Today's my day off. I was at the Dodger game, uh, and here it was. You had uh, Kike Hernandez up to bat, and, uh, you know, the pitching continued. <laughs> Uh, and all of a sudden, there's kind of this roar in the crowd. Kind of a hush goes over the crowd, and then people going. You hear you hear conversations. You hear kind of a roar going. But look, two pitches continue to Kike Hernandez. Uh, the game continued even though, uh, and then it stopped for a second or two after it became very clear to the umpire that there was an earthquake. But everybody was like, you know, looking around, is that an earthquake? Is that an earthquake? Then you see the foul poles mm -hmm. doing this. Right. And then you know it's an earthquake. And it was like you. I was, uh, I was in section, where was I? We were in the, we were in the left field section. Uh, uh, section six, row U. Uh, so we were underneath that overhang. We were oh. underneath the mezzanine. So I'm looking up at that, going, "I hope this stops soon." Right. Because I'm re and we're and my wife and I are looking at each other, and we got the kids with us. And what's the plan going to be? What are we going to do? Right. Which get, direction? We were we decided if this keeps going, if it gets worse, we're running down out to the field. Right. Because we don't want this overhang over us exactly. while this continues. And, and, and you said that they continued to pitch. It's quite possible the pitcher didn't feel it right. because it really depends on where you are. Really I didn't does. feel the 6.4 yesterday. I was driving, didn't yeah. feel it at all. I had no idea until I got to my destination and mm -hmm. everyone there was talking about it. Yeah. So it's, you know, 
Quite a thing. So there, that's really the reason. Uh, yeah, about about two hours ago, I was wearing uh, something much different than this. <laughs> Thank you for coming in. Luckily, I had this in my office to change into. But uh, yeah, I was wearing my my, my Dodger jersey, cheering mm -hmm. them on, mm -hmm. and uh, all of a sudden, this happens. So let's. Uh, yeah, quite an experience there for some 57,000 people or so who all right. went through that earthquake together. Right. Uh, and uh, I think we're going to check in with Scott Reif. He's in Air 7. Scott. Yeah, you know, all those scary stories. I mean, we're just so fortunate. Uh, we got airborne, I would say, uh, 30, 40 minutes after the earthquake occurred, maybe a little bit longer than that, just before 9 o'clock. And, uh, you know, immediately we tried to get with the LAPD, we get with the uh, county fire, city fire, the helicopters that were up. And for the most part, they were already landing. Now, we're over the uh, west end of the valley uh, right here. And, you know, during the 94 earthquake, I lived in this area, and we got hit hard. And I really feel for those folks in Ridgecrest because, you know, basically what I remember living in Chatsworth after the Northridge earthquake was four or five days without electricity and all the aftershocks and just how nervous you get each time one hits because you just don't know if it's going to get bigger and the building's going to collapse on you at night when you're sleeping in the dark because you have no electricity. Uh, phone service was out. So I really feel for those folks out there. Unfortunately, we just can't get up there in the dark to get a good look of what type of damage they're looking at. Uh, but fortunately, what we can tell you, as we've seen, uh, we've flown around Los Angeles, down towards a uh, portion of Orange County, up into Santa Clarita, and now we're in the valley. We've seen no damage. So certainly fantastic. Fantastic news as far as this area is concerned. Uh, City Fire, their helicopters, and uh, LA County Fire, they all landed. Uh, they did get out. They checked a lot of freeway overcrossings just as precautions. And uh, so far, no reports of any damage or injuries. So uh, certainly, uh, I know I was at home. And the dogs were aware of it. They certainly were a little frightened. Of course, my wife and uh, my daughter uh, were after it happened. And uh, we live in the West Valley, and we felt it pretty good. So I can only imagine, though, uh, Mark, at the game, and when you're underneath maybe, uh, you know, one of those aisles and all of a sudden it starts shaking. I mean, that's got to be frightening just starting to decide when am I going to run? Yeah, you kind of have to make a decision. And we had, so not to get too detailed, but our daughter has two of her friends with us. So we oh, had wow. some, we yeah. had... We had four, three seven-year-old girls and our son, oh, who's goodness. three, and we're all, you know, we're trying to figure out, all right, who's going to grab who? How right. are we going to get them down to the oh. field quickly right. with all these other people right. if it looks like this thing's going right. to, you know, if it starts getting worse? And you feel a, a bigger sense of responsibility when you have someone else's children with you. Sure. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And a frightening aspect of that is, you know, if it just would have went on a little bit longer, it wouldn't have been a big enough earthquake to cause damage and harm you. Mm -hmm. But once panic sets in, if Absolutely. everybody would have started to run, you would have had people injured just trying to get out. So fortunately, we didn't have that because you start to, to look at those things and uh, exponentially it would just take off. And once panic sets in, uh, people are going to get hurt. All yeah, and thank goodness that didn't happen. There, uh, the quake was also felt in Playa Vista. A friend texted me that they were watching Spider-Man, and it was about 15 seconds. Mm -hmm. they, they sat through the first 15 seconds, and then at that point, the entire theater got up very orderly and really? walked out of the theater, yes, um, and got tickets uh, for to, to return to, to see return. the movie another yeah. time, so that's good. But I want to share this also. Um, they have felt this quake in Scottsdale, Arizona, the shaking wasn't significant reportedly, but it's uh, it's noteworthy that the 7.1 quake was felt 450 miles away in Arizona, mm -hmm. uh, and they, it was felt in uh, Mammoth as well. Um, again, so again, this quake has has uh, touched many, many, many people. Right, and we're getting uh, information now from DWP. Uh, the power is out in Encino, has been out in part of Encino Valley Glen area, affecting about a thousand customers. Crews assessing those area. They believe it's related to the quake, not confirmed as yet. Uh, they're assessing, they're going to know more in the morning, but they're cautioned that if they, it, it's a caution that is universal whenever there's an earthquake, whenever there's a down power line for whatever reason, stay away from it, don't go near it, assume that any downed line is a power line and that it is charged, stay away from it, keep everybody away from it, and report it. Right, and some positive news, LA City Fire was on emergency mode earlier, uh, they uh, looked through the city and they say that they're back to normal operations, no major infrastructure damage in the city of Los Angeles, so that is at least some positive uh, news. And then I believe okay. we, we have some video of a house fire. This is in Ridgecrest. Uh, reportedly, this fire started when there was a gas line rupture. That has not been confirmed, but that's what they believe happened here. Look at these uh, mm -hmm. picture here. That's uh, 
very unsettling. Um, yeah. So right. So, and th this is a, kind of a mirror image of what happened yesterday in Ridgecrest, where a, uh, a fire broke out in someone's garage. They were able to save that house, although there were two uh, uh, vintage vehicles, two uh, uh, classic cars that were in there. But let's let's hear from someone here regarding this fire. What did you feel? Describe for me what you felt. The earthquake was bouncing. It was knocked my toolbox over. I came outside, walked around a corner, and that thing was 100 foot high. Flames. Just like that. Bam. Ain't no mercy on that one. My friend just called me. You can see it from three miles away. You can see it. Describe for me that moment when you first felt it. Oh, the earthquake? Boy, that's scary because it knocked my TV over this time and my toolbox. I just put everything away. Um, it was big. It's never a big one. Much bigger than the one a couple days ago. But not as long. I think it's shorter. It's interesting he said shorter. Mm -hmm. I've heard from several people that today's felt longer. But It yeah. depends really on where you are, how the earthquake is propagating through the earth that you're standing on. Uh, it really does strike in different ways in different places. If there's a lot of sediment, for example, in the earth that you're standing on, say it's a dry lake bed or, a, or an area that used to have a lot of sand, it's got a lot of sand underneath mm -hmm. it or, uh, then, and not solid like clay, it feels different than if you're standing on rock or on a mountain or on a hillside. It's just, it just kind of depends on where you are. Absolutely. Okay, uh, Jory Rand uh, is uh, standing by. I believe he is still in Valencia. Is that correct, Jory? What can you tell us? Yeah, Valencia Town Center. Earlier, uh, we talked to some folks who really didn't think it was a big deal. We spoke to several people who were inside the movie theater here at Valencia Town Center at the time. Um, some people evacuated, some people did not. We are here with Sonia, who is among those who did evacuate the theater. Uh, tell us what happened. Well, they were sitting, getting ready to see the movie. Uh, the probability of a magnitude 6 in the next... A uh, week is over 50 percent, something probably around 60 percent, and uh, a very preliminary estimate, a probability of a 7 might be as high as 11 percent. So all of that saying, we're having a very robust sequence, not a surprise. It's going to continue. There's no reason to think that it's going to be stopping. Um, so far in the last uh, couple of hours, we recorded two magnitude 5s, 16 magnitude 4s, and over 50 magnitude threes just in the, the last two hours. Uh, it does seem to be dying down a bit. You know, that first hour we were seeing a lot of stuff. The ground is moving enough that we're not seeing the smaller earthquakes at this point. We really aren't seeing anything below magnitude three just because our the ground's moving enough from the fours and fives that uh, you it, can't it, see it, below that. The telemetry is eating that up. Right, exactly. It's eating that up. Um, so. Uh, and it's 100% uh, that you're going to have this sequence ongoing for the next... Well, there, we have never seen a sequence like this suddenly stop, yeah. right? So uh, the aftershocks will continue. It's following a pretty traditional pattern, uh, but on the high side. So if you, you know, how many aftershocks will you get to a seven? Some of them have just a small number. Some of them have a lot. We're on the upper 50 percentile. Um, and this is definitely a robust sequence, but it's far from uh, unprecedented. It's uh, it's just on the high side of average. And Lucy, can you discuss the, the aftershocks again, the, the size of them and how many you've had? Okay, so far we've recorded uh, two that are above magnitude five, 16 above magnitude four, and um, uh, 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 over 50 that are above magnitude 3. And the chances of another 7 plus in your mind? Uh, there's an estimate, a very preliminary estimate right now of about 10 percent, about a 1 in 10 chance that we could have another 7 within the sequence. Uh, that's uh, calculated for the next week. And what about the greater. 6 and the 5, please? What about the 6 and 5? Uh, okay, so the, the chance of something bigger than 6 is actually a bit over 50 percent. About a, about a, you know, one in two, a little better than one in 50-50 chance, and the the chance for fives is is approaching certainty. It's uh, it would be extremely unusual if we didn't have another five. Well, that's typically week. within like three days, right? Three days. That, this yeah. is a, these estimates are all for a week. A week. All right. Okay. So the most likely time is right now. Okay. The other thing, remember the way they die off with time, and we were seeing it after the six, and it seems to be, you know, we seem to be getting into the die off period here on the seven. Whatever number you have in the first 24 hours, 
the next 24 hours will have about half that many, and the next 24 hours will have about a third that many, et cetera. So the 10th day will have one-tenth as many as we have on the first day. The, and what that means is it will go down pretty quickly, and then we'll have a really long tail where it will continue for, to have the risk for quite a while. The last time we've had earthquakes of this size, we were seeing significant aftershocks for more than a year, for several years. And these are still to the northwest as well? So far, everything we're seeing, we, we do seem to be having some uh, inc you know, continued activity on the uh, southwest striking part of that, the L-shaped, uh, but the majority are, uh, are up to the, the north. So can you describe, uh, Dr. Graves, uh, the color coordination there, the Obviously, the large blue one is the main shock. Right. Yeah. So the 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 colors that are on the the reds are the most recent events, uh, and so you can see that when you say recent, well, one hour. Yeah, within the last hour. So those we would say are all associated with the magnitude 7.1. Those are aftershocks, and you know they're spread out a bit, but you do see this cluster up to the very northwest. We would speculate that's where the rupture may have stopped, but we can't confirm that until we actually have some more data and have people out, get the reports back from the, from uh, people in the field. You said you have geologists on the ground there. Are they reporting back to you? No, uh, we have not been able to get communication. It's going to be difficult actually to get out there because it is on the naval uh, uh, weapon station. Uh, and it's dark. And it's and dark. And there's unexplored ordinance. Yeah. So, you know, there's some logistical challenges there. Obviously, too, these people were right at ground zero for a major earthquake. Have and we spoken with them at all since the Yeah, event? so so I have had communications. Our geologists and engineers are okay, but, the, you know, it's nighttime. There may be issues driving around on roads. There may be structures that are damaged. We have some unconfirmed reports of uh, gas fires in, uh, in the uh, city of Ridgecrest and, and so forth. So there's, you know, there's a lot of other stuff to deal with that's much more important than trying to get out on uh, uh, and, and look at the fault. But restating what you said earlier, that it's trending away from Southern California. Okay. Yes, and we, I think it's worth reminding because we're talking about the probabilities, we're talking about triggered earthquakes. It's important to remind people mostly you trigger the earthquakes right where you had the first one. The ability to trigger dies off very rapidly with distance. There's some possibility as, you know, out for a few times the fault length. So we, we, we don't usually, we haven't seen triggered earthquakes more than about three to four times the length of the fault that, it, that moved in the main shock. And this looks to be about 25 miles long. So we're getting out, you know, maybe out, out over 70, 80 miles. We, we possible to see stuff. That's the extreme of it. And are, do we know what triggered this one, the 7 one? Well, it was triggered by the 6.4. Uh, so this is an earthquake sequence. These earthquakes are related. If you go and do a calculation, what's the chance that they're independent? It's essentially zero. And you Dr. Were Jones, before, you were calculating before, just guesstimating on the power logarithmically of a 7.1 being larger than a 6.4. Could you go over that again? How much? Uh, I didn't go and redo the calculations. Did no. you? Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, so. Uh, um, let me do this quickly in my head. I think it's about it, it's about a factor of eight more powerful in terms of the amount of energy that that is released during the earthquake. Now it's 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 being released over a larger area and a longer time and a longer time. And and I think that's you know uh, folks here in the LA region can attest to that. The ground shaking was was pretty long. We would estimate that the actual rupture for this magnitude 7.1 probably took between 15 and 20 seconds you know for it to rupture to start at the epicenter and then propagates out across the fault um, until we get a chance to look at the data in more detail we can't be more certain about that and yesterday you said the 6.4 was about five seconds five to ten we got some data that showed it was a little on the slow side yeah a little longer and this one probably about the same again these are you know the data needs to be downloaded and massaged and it's friday night and Dr. so <laughs> Dr. One, one, one question i always find fascinating is because we had, i've heard you talk about it before like you know as best you can tell the information isn't in the earth's surface That's, in advance of an earthquake uh, that we can go okay something's going to happen there but does you know this all retrospect of course does this get us does this help that research 
Well, we will go in and look, but uh, I spent a couple of decades trying to find something that was different about foreshocks than other earthquakes and never found it. We will go in and look, and, and, and one thing to be said, we have more data. We have much better stations now for this sequence than we've had for any previous foreshocks that we looked at. So if there's something there, we'll try and find it, but uh, it's not obvious. And you, you talked at the top about the probability of a seven or greater magnitude. Does that include the, the possibility that this could just be another foreshock? Is that possible? Yeah. Yes, included in that, uh, that approximately one in 10 chance of a seven or bigger. That's a 7.0, 7.1, 7.2, oh, 3.8 coming in. Okay. What's your plan over the next couple of, you know, uh, next week or so? What did you, are you guys like stationed here or studying this thing? Or? He actually yeah. still has a paid job here. Right? Uh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, yeah, we are going to be working. Okay, well, we're that's coming in. Uh, it, you know, we it's lost the signal there for a second, but they said an aftershock is coming in. Probably about 20 seconds or so, that aftershock is going to hit right. Pasadena, about a 3.8, they said, 3.8 coming in. So Yes, that was the, the shake alert system that they're watching uh, unfold before their eyes. And earlier we saw it when David was with me. Uh, they said that there would be a 5.7 in 26 seconds, and mm -hmm. we watched the clock go down. And at zero, we saw the lights hanging yeah. uh, move. It might not have been a 5.7 magnitude, but it was definitely the shake mm -hmm. that that shake alert system had uh, notified everyone about. Right. And, so. uh, you know, people talked yesterday about the shake alert system, why it didn't alert people, and it wasn't a failure of the system. The system was calibrated for something that would be catastrophic or damaging right. or dangerous, reaching right. specifically the L.A. area. Right. And it didn't meet the parameters for that. Right. And, right. Uh, and this kind of everything kind of got borne out in that way that it, it didn't right. do that. And this is a developing system. They keep saying that they're going to learn a lot from this mm -hmm. uh, sequence of quakes. Uh, and so they have a lot more uh, sensors on the ground now, hundreds of sensors, stations, mm -hmm. uh, and they're going to have a clearer picture of how this all works. And so this uh, robust Bust, uh, sequence that Lucy Jones keeps calling it is going to be uh, very educational for them and will help uh, them develop the shake alert system even more. All right, we're going to go yeah. over some information about this quake as we just saw kind of a blacked out area of the West Valley. Uh, things to do after an earthquake. We're just kind of kind of team up and, and talk, talk to you about this. Mm -hmm. Check yourself for injuries. That's, of course, the, the first thing you got to do. Make sure you're okay. Uh, you're going to look for and extinguish small fires if you see them, of course. Mm -hmm. And uh, leave your gas on at uh, the main valve unless you smell gas or think that it's leaking. We heard from someone in mm -hmm. Bridgecrest earlier, Felicia, I believe, mm -hmm. who said that uh, they were hearing people yell throughout the neighborhood to turn off the gas, and they did, they did that, yeah. although we're telling you to leave the gas on the main valve unless you smell gas. All right, we're going we're gonna to get back to that in a second. Let's go back to that power outage. This is Encino. Uh, and uh, through our sky map technology, you can see exactly what streets are affected, what neighborhood is affected. Uh, this is, well, obviously you see it. There it is, uh, bordered by Moore Park Street, pretty much to the, uh, to on one side, Densmore, Gloria, Lameda Street. Uh, a power outage there. You see uh, emergency uh, vehicles there. DWP is, we assume, uh, uh, knowledgeable about this and knows to respond there. And so that is one area that we know is blacked out. We did, don't know did, if it's earthquake related. Uh, did do we? we hear that it was about a thousand people? Is that correct? We a had initial reports of a thousand people in different parts, kind of scattered through the West Valley, mainly in the Valley Glen area. This is kind of uh, more, I think, Encino, but Valley Glen kind of, kind of also incorporate uh, is incorporated there. Uh, so that's uh, the the area that's that's blacked out at this point. Okay, not good for those folks. Okay, let's check in with Jory Rand back in Valencia. Jory? Yeah, uh, when we when that press conference started, we were talking to Sonia, who was in the movie theaters tonight with three of her family members. She was a trooper and waited with us for a while for that press conference to play out, but security moved us, and then, and then she had to go. Uh, we can tell you that uh, everyone we talked to tonight was going to see Spider-Man. Some of them left the theater at the time. Some of them did not. We spoke with one young man who said a young girl behind him in the theater wound up having a panic attack in the middle of the movie. While the earthquake was still shaking, he wound up climbing over seats to help her. I believe we have some of that sound on tape if we can go to that now. 
everything just started shaking and people were like looking around and everyone just stood up and some people with younger kids left the like the whole theater like the movie theater and like walked out um some people flipped out and kind of had a little panic attack well we were sitting there watching the movies and then all of a sudden i felt a little shaking and it kept getting stronger and stronger and i said it's an earthquake happening and and after about 10, 20 seconds, people started getting up and leaving the theater. Maybe a third or a quarter of the theater got up and left. Okay, so that first girl that we spoke with, that we just heard from, her brother uh, was sitting right next to her, and he's the one that heard heavy breathing. He said he has a friend who suffers from panic attacks and knew the sound of it. He turned around and asked her if she was okay. At some point too. And that'll be a much different story. San Andreas, remember that we said between the 6.4 and the 7.1 is about a factor of 8. 7.1 to 7.8 is the same difference, and it will be that much bigger. So it, you know, a 7.8 on the San Andreas is going to be at least eight times bigger than this earthquake, and of course, a lot of it be a lot closer to us. But consider this is only one, you know, 10% the size of the San Andreas earthquake is a pretty big earthquake. And I don't think we should underestimate, just because we didn't get hit that badly, just how difficult it really is right now in the Owens Valley. Going from memory, the earthquake we had, that was, it was Easter Sunday. Okay, in Easter Sunday 2010, there was uh, April 4th, <laughs> the Elmayar Kukapa earthquake, a magnitude 7.2. I haven't been including that because it wasn't in California. The rupture was completely within Mexico. So yes, we felt it and probably a similar sort of distance. Well, it didn't feel quite as strong here. We were a little farther away. Um, but it, uh, it was not one of our fault systems. So when we're talking about earthquake rates, what's happening on the faults, I, I didn't include that. Can you remind us, like you talked about yesterday, there's no way to predict when the next the big one is coming, right? That there's, this is all random. Right. All of this is random, and it's something people don't like. Uh, on top of that random distribution, we Her uh, signal there. We'll try to get it back. Uh, it looks like somebody probably kicked the, kicked the plug. There she is. Oh, we've Lucy had a couple back. thousand earthquakes probably at this point. The count was about 1,500 before the before the 7.1 happened. Now uh, we've only really recorded probably 100 earthquakes since the 7.1, but that's because the ground's moving so much that we can't see the smaller ones. On a grassroots level, we, I, we under, all understand uh, of, of what you're saying, well, not all of it probably, but um, <laughs> there, there are some people out there who are thinking, well, maybe this takes the heat off LA County. Maybe this will relieve the pressure on what's going on more locally. Could you address that? Okay, I just, whenever one earthquake happens, we get a lot of questions. Does this relieve the pressure over here? Does it make this earthquake worse? What does this tell about the future? What does it mean? And the problem is, it, what it means is we have earthquakes. And that's really all it means. It is a random distribution. It doesn't make a big earthquake more or less likely. Uh, and what we have here in Southern California, you know, I, maybe we're seeing a situation where um, I, we've had this big drought. Maybe that was random fluctuation, in which case we say, well, the long-term rate is definitely higher than what we've been having for the last 20 years, and we're going to have be, we really need to be having more earthquakes. Or potentially there was some significance to it. In which case, you know, well, one earthquake, it's hard to say that you've changed the rate, but probably, you know, if we've gone back to a higher rate, then we're back at a higher rate. And we just really need to remember the last 20 years was not representative of what we have. We need to average out just from what geology tells us. Yeah, and also, just as Dr. Jones said. Okay. All right. Would we'll you, get the signal back, I think, but in the meantime, we can kind of, you know, amplify what she was talking about, the random minor, distribution. It's, minor we, all, we all want to Again, be able to figure out that there's a pattern process. that we can hold on You can't on predict to. it. And you can't. You can't predict it, no. I, I, think, I think we have them back. The energy release, say, in Loma Prieta, uh, over time, uh, that the shadow returns. Well, yeah, and there's yeah. actually, when, when an earthquake occurs, there's a redistribution of, of stress. So it can relieve stress in some areas, but it can also load in, up, load up or, or, or promote the possibility of, of another earthquake happening. And that's exactly what we saw here. The 6.4 actually promoted the chance for the 7.1 to occur. 
So that's when you know the triggering can happen like that. Even though an earthquake, the 6.4 did release some stress, it actually promoted the, the, the subsequent right. one to And occur. there's really sort of two different phenomena going on. There's how do, what long, what's our long-term rate of earthquakes, when are things happening, that fundamentally random distribution of which fault goes next. And then there's how one earthquake m modulates that. And mostly it's happening really nearby. We have had a couple of situations, probably three here in California, where we've had an extremely large earthquake, and the rate of other earthquakes goes down for a while. Uh, we had it after the Kern County earthquake, we saw it after Landers and Northridge, and we saw it after the 1906 earthquake. Um, and, you know, this is, you know, we, we don't, we don't have enough data, right? Only a seismologist says it, I realize that. But with the limited, you know, we don't, with what data we have, we can hypothesize whether that's a significant pattern or whether that's happenstance. Um, and we're, we're still trying to understand that. But so you have your long-term rate, and then you have the earthquake triggering. How does one earthquake affect the other? What are the stress changes that happen right now? Um, and that's. You know, we could see yesterday that we made slip on that northwest fault easier to happen. That doesn't mean it's got to keep on moving there. And that's why we ended up giving probabilities, because sometimes it happens, most of the time it doesn't. Uh, this, hap this is one of those times that it's really... And you might get more data as a result of this. We hope to have data that allows us to say quite a bit about more. And you said the, the proximity to this one to San Andreas, it didn't increase the stress on San Andreas at all. It's still pretty far, yeah. It's really too far away so that even, I mean, this one's going to have a bit more impact because it's a bigger earthquake, um, but it's still far enough away that it really is, with our rule of thumb that it's, you know, three or four fault links is about as far as we ever see it. Um, and we're, we're probably a little over four fault lengths away from the San Andreas. Uh, so it's closer than when we had the 6.4, but it's still not at the, uh, a level that gets us to get up and jump. I'm looking at the time and the fact that it's 10 of 11, and you guys probably all have newscasts at 11 o'clock. You're it. <laughs> uh, my suggestion was we go and do one more check for data and plan on doing a restatement at 11 where we can give you the details at that point so you can use this for your broadcasts. Okay. But let us go see what we got. Yeah. Yep. Uh, can I just say I love Juicy Lucy Jones. Uh, she is such an amazing resource. Loved her since 94. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, the, the takeaways that I, that are staying with me is that we have a 50% chance of a six of magnitude six point quake happening mm -hmm. over the next week and a 11% 11 11% chance of a seven magnitude seven quake happening uh, in this next week and we've had what 50 magnitude three quakes we've right. had 16 magnitude four and two magnitude five quakes since that 7.1 and she says this is fairly typical it's on the high side of normal but this is a robust fault system she talked about this yesterday as this as this being a robust fault system capable of producing sizable earthquakes. She was proven right, of course, again. Mm -hmm. And uh, Miriam Hernandez has been at Caltech now for two days in a row, speaking with Dr. Lucy Jones and Dr. R Robert Graves there, uh, talking to us about uh, trying to give science to these uh, lay people who are asking all these questions, trying to make sense of what is happening here. Miriam, uh, what can you tell us? Uh, we're going to try to get here. to uh, What we've been hearing about is just a lot of quake activity leading up to this 7.1 this evening. It all started with a foreshock yesterday at 10 o'clock in the morning at about a 4.0 magnitude. It then went to a 2.5 a few minutes later and then to uh, that larger quake, a 6.4. There have been very strong aftershocks ever since. Uh, there was one early this morning and then it was all capped off by the 7.1 uh, this this evening at about 8:22, uh, I can tell you that uh, after they have, after they that one hit, that major shock hit, they have redefined what was the four shock and what was the major shock. So the 7.1 now, the major shock, and uh, what happened yesterday is just considered a four shock. They say that the uh, fault where this happened has elongated, or they 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 notice now that the movement has elongated. 
elongated, and it's gone closer to independence. It's gone closer northwest of the initial shock, so further away from Ridgecrest, closer to the Naval Air Weapons Station, so not nearly as populated, thank goodness. The field teams have not gone to examine the uh, for any rupture in the earth yet. They'll wait until daylight to do that, but they don't expect uh, tremendous damage uh, actually along that fault. Of course, as, as Mark was pointing out earlier, we feel the shaking according to the composition of the soil that's beneath us. In Mexico City in 1985, that, that capital city shook like it was on a bowl of jello because it was an old um, lake bed. Well, this area is near China Lake, so obviously a lot of shaking would be felt here. Um, I'm going to be looking some of my, my notes. Uh, so again, uh, talking about the probability of another quake, uh, there could be another large one. It's a very small chance, a 5% chance, but the chance that this one would hit, this 7.1, that was also a very small chance. So there is that possibility, there is that potential that there could be another large quake. Uh, Dr. Lucy Jones made it clear, though, that this series of quakes does not impact any system in L.A. County. It does not increase the possibility or lessen the possibility. The same possibility exists as there as it was uh, yesterday. So we are still seeing the possibility of, of a quake here in Los Angeles County. And of course, the San Andreas Fault uh, continues to build pressure. That is the one that practically it's the state, so it, it, it is, um, it is uh, important to just be aware of that potential. So they're looking at all the quakes here on this map over here. If you see all those dots there, that blue, can you see that one, Chris, on the right-hand side? This is uh, the U.S. Geological Survey map. That big blue dot, that is the 7.1. The red dots are the aftershocks that have happened like within the last hour, and you can see how they're spread out. And especially Especially those ones going northwest, uh, a lot of those blue dots. Uh, excuse me, a lot of those 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 red dots. Uh, Dr. Jones says that these will continue to uh, to happen um, in the next 24 hours, but after the next two hours, uh, they should be diminishing. So they won't be as frequent uh, from this 7.1 uh, major shock, but they still will um, be continuing. Uh, in fact, she says that we can expect aftershocks from this quake, from the 7.1, to last for about a year. She says that is the, that is the pattern that was established um, last uh, time there was a major earthquake, uh, 1999, and that uh, the people there in Ridgecrest are just going to have to get used to the fact that this rumbling, these shakes, are going to be happening very frequently. We are going to get another update at about 11 o'clock. Um, we're going to wait for that and let you know what happens here, what additional information they're able to glean from the data they are examining. For now, reporting live from Caltech, Miriam Hernandez, ABC7 Eyewitness News. All right, Miriam Hernandez at Caltech for a second day in a row for a second huge earthquake in Southern California. That has been kind of the focal point for people gaining information about what has, uh, is a random series of events, but a very frightening series of events. Dr. Lucy Jones, again, the center of attention today, describing what happened and the scientific uh, elements that were involved in describing and uh, dealing with what happened. Eyewitness News at 11 about to begin right now. Let's hear from Dr. Lucy Jones. By definition, because the 7.1 is the largest, we give it the name main shock. So yesterday or an hour ago, we were calling the 6.4 the main shock. It has now had an aftershock that's bigger than itself. And so we changed the name. And the 6.4 is now a foreshock, and that really large aftershock has become the main shock. All right. And uh, a magnitude 6.9, 7.1 rather, quake uh, shaking up the Southland. It was felt from the West Coast to Arizona. The epicenter was near Ridgecrest, where this house caught fire moments after the quake hit. And that earthquake made a lot of waves in pools across Southern California. We have crews spread out covering any potential damage. 
Chef Jose Andres had a relief team in Ridgecrest already when uh, this evening's quake hit. This fire in Ridgecrest, Ridgecrest uh, he says this is a gas explosion, which is very common after big quakes. All right, very common and still unsettling to see. Fires, a frequent result of earthquakes dating back to 1906. And then, of course, through 1994, uh, the Northridge quake, the October 17, 1989 quake in Loma Prieta in the Bay Area, which also interrupted a baseball game, by the way. The World <laughs> Series back then between the A's yes. and the Giants. Who could forget that? Uh, the play definitely stopped and stayed stopped that time. But what we're seeing here is a fire that resulted, we believe, from the quake. People going up and down the streets in Ridgecrest saying, shut off your gas lines. Not necessarily the right thing to do, though. Only if you smell gas, only if there is fire should you do that because it takes a long time to get your gas restarted. It takes a technician to do that, and you could be without gas unnecessarily for a long period of time. So you, only if you need to do that do you do that. Right. Thousands of people, thousands upon thousands of people have felt this quake. We've heard from uh, people in uh, uh, Playa Vista, in Westwood, uh, in uh, Culver City. Mm -hmm. We've heard in, in Glendale, obviously, uh, here we felt it. Uh, and then as far away as Mexico. Um, and, and we heard from uh, L.A. City fire officials earlier. No major infrastructure has, uh, infrastructure damage, I should say, has been found in the city of Los Angeles. But authorities have been reporting injuries and damage from this quake uh, uh, reported, but we, we still don't have, we haven't seen evidence of that mm -hmm. yet, uh, you know, with the exception of that fire. Right, and so we're waiting for officials in Ridgecrest to give us more information about any potential casualties. There were casualties yesterday. They weren't major casualties, but people did suffer injuries. More the type of cuts okay. and bruises, people walking in bare feet through broken glass in the wake of an earthquake, which can tend to happen. But what you're looking at here is video from today's quake. Look at what happened in this store in the the Ridgecrest area. Clearly some structural damage there. You look at the ceiling tire tiles that fell out and Dr. Lucy Jones now has been able to make some calculations. She's going to hit the podium there shortly. She along with her colleague from the U.S. Geological Survey will be speaking to the reporters in just a couple of minutes. They've been pretty much steadily out there and they're trying to get as much information as they can by going back over the calculations, crunching the numbers if you will, to make more determinations about what we're dealing with here and the likelihood of a additional quakes and what the size and frequency of those additional quakes might be. And we, we're going to check in with her right now. Or We've been uh, receiving so many uh, videos uh, of uh, different, of, you know, what the quake looked like in different places. Uh, one that I saw was the evacuation of passengers in Ontario onto the jetway. They were at the airport uh, and uh, that was uh, unsettling for those people mm -hmm. there. We've seen chandeliers shaking, uh, you know, light, other light fixtures. Uh, shaking, um, people reporting water splashing out of their pools and mm -hmm. their ponds. Um, and again, there was that question about w was the 7.1 longer than the 6.4? We heard some conflicting reports, but Lucy mm -hmm. Jones saying tonight that it, it was longer. It was about 10 seconds longer than the 6.4. And they were doing the math kind of uh, on the podium there. They figured out it was about eight times stronger than the quake yesterday. And that really says something. This is not an arithmetic progression. It's geometrical, I believe. So let's listen to Dr. Lucy Jones. For your patience, uh, we're, we want to give a bit of a summary on tonight's earthquake. Of course, we had a, a magnitude 7.1. It is part of the ongoing uh, sequence that we're calling Searles Valley. Um, so it's uh, strongly affected both Ridgecrest and, and China Lake. Um, the earthquake yesterday, the magnitude 6.4, we are now calling a foreshock because the 7.1 tonight is larger. That's really is just a semantic distinction. We have a sequence of earthquakes and we have a 4.8 aftershock that is just beginning and will be uh, coming down here soon, but we shouldn't have any shaking. Um, we should turn the sound off, yeah. Uh, one thing we wanted to show you, oh, the estimate is now up to five. Maybe we will fill it, let's see. Um, we, this will, if this is a five, it will be our third aftershock of magnitude five or greater. Um, and the, uh, uh, we've also had, uh, I just got the total, 17 magnitude 4s and over 70 magnitude 3s uh, since the main shock happened. And um, we have the aftershock going, you know, this, this comes out as actually 5, it will uh, be the third one above magnitude 5. And I just felt that. Okay. Yeah. Very, 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 very slightly, we, we barely yeah. felt it. Um, 
The one thing that we added to this was we, we brought up a, a picture. We find uh, our first photo in from the field from uh, USGS geologist Ben Brooks. Maybe, Rob, you want to take yeah, this? Yeah, so as I mentioned earlier, we do have geologists in the field. So they are able to get out. This is along Highway 178 that it actually had been damaged in a different area during the magnitude 6.4. What we're looking at here is damage associated presumably with a fault offset. Uh, you can see where the road on the, uh, down, the, down the road it is actually moved to the right. So this is the right lateral horizontal displacement that we were talking about earlier that's associated with the larger event, with a magnitude 7.1. There's about... And the road appears to be... Yeah, it's down towards the kind of the southeast end of, of this uh, magnitude 7.1 sequence. So Closer to Trona than to... Yes, yes clo closer to Trona. Um, right here. And we, we, we suspect that the, that the fault is actually ruptured much further to the northwest that is the area that's on the uh, the, the, the China Lake uh, Naval Weapons Station. So the, uh, presumably they're not able to get out there tonight. But we are obviously seeing uh, displacements that are associated with this earthquake. And what it, what is seen here, this is about 30 centimeters. Uh, so it's a, about one foot. The, about a the, foot in total. And you can, one thing you can notice in this is it's actually not just a single break. All right, right. there's a dis distribution across a numerous fault yeah. strands. And that's what we had also seen before. Uh, this is a... Only 3.6. 3.6. out how to turn the sound off. Yeah. yeah. Well, Robert, let me ask you this. So does that mean that we're looking at a surface rupture of yes. about 25 miles in length? Well, uh, this is just one point. Yeah. And it's down towards the south. Uh, I would speculate that we will find surface rupture along to the northwest as well. Am I incorrect in thinking that there would be more of a surface uh, rupture closer to where the point of, of origin is? No, it, 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 it can be highly variable. And in fact, in, in a number of cases, where the epicenter is located actually has the, a smaller amount of slip. There w if there's a pat there's a, there's a huge variability. Uh, at the ends of the fault, you often see less than you see in the middle of the fault because, you know, it's tapering off before it ends. And this does appear to be at the very southern end of the rupture zone. Yeah, yeah. So hopefully the, they'll be able to get out uh, maybe tomorrow or the next day and look along uh, other sections of the rupture. But uh, this is a, a you know pretty dramatic uh, picture. Fortunately, they were able to actually get out there tonight. Uh, presumably, I think these guys and gals are going to be working throughout the night to gather as much data as they can. But we should see more of this tomorrow. I suspect so, yes. Yeah. How many people are out there? Uh, you know, I don't have an exact count, but I would say probably uh, 10 to 15, maybe more. There's a few of them that have come from the USGS, but there's also a geologist from the Southern California Earthquake Center, which is a consortium of all the universities. So I think we're seeing scientists from a lot of the UCs uh, and a lot of other institutions are going to be the, uh, right. out there because you don't get many chances when you're a field geologist to get to collect this sort of data. And, uh, on, on that note, I was in Ridgecrest until just a couple hours ago, and I ran into geologists pretty much everywhere I went, and a lot of them were there just casually because of the fact that they got to see what was happening up there. At what point do all of those people become activated and become a network of information? Yeah, so this is, it, it's actually very uh, difficult logistically to coordinate all this. Uh, the USGS has teamed up with the California Geological Survey to take the lead on this, is, which is uh, typically what's done in these uh, uh, type of situations. But as Lucy said, there are lots of other geologists and scientists who can help out. They are actually setting up a, a, a command or coordination center out in the field so that people know where to go. They're not stepping on each other's toes. They can uh, use their resources as best as possible, or mo uh, most efficiently as possible. Uh, and it's beca there used to be a time when it was more chaotic. We now uh, usually try to coordinate. We have set up a clearing house. Yeah. And, uh, 
Um, we're gradually starting to, even the geologists come into the 21st century and start having apps to be able to share the information. So uh, each earthquake, we, we get a little farther down that digital spectrum. Yeah. Yeah. About the depth of the earthquake again, you said it was uh, perhaps 10 miles deep. Does that define the intensity at all? No, no. no. So that, that's just where it started. And as I mentioned just uh, a couple minutes ago, Many times the epicenter or the hypocenter, which is the location of depth, uh, may have a small amount of slip relative to the other parts of the fault. As the rupture propagates out across that fault, it can grow. You can get much larger displacements and much greater release of energy. And, and this picture is proof that the fault ruptured all the way up to the surface. And Lucy, you mentioned earlier that a five plus was a certainty for the rest of the time there. Have those percentages changed at all in the last 20 minutes? No. Doctor, when, so, you, when you talk about the, this being a 7.1 there, what is it that we're feeling in L.A. kind of roughly as far as... The magnitude, it does not depend on location. It is a 7.1 period. There's no location adapt, ad, to that. To describe what we feel, we talk about intensity. And it looks like it was intensity 3 to 4 in the Los Angeles area, depending on exactly where you were. For those tuning in at 11 o'clock, uh, so the aftershock sequence is not a surprise. It's vigorous, but it's in line with what right. we've seen before. Not surprised with a 7-1, maybe not anticipating it, but that's also within the within you know, the ballpark. In, you know, in California, we, Southern California would expect to have a magnitude 7 <laughs> once every 15 or 20 years. Uh, the last one was 20 years ago. We would expect to have a 6 every three years or so, and the bigger surprise is that we've gone 20 years without a six. Uh, this is more, think of this as a return to what California is supposed to be doing, rather than really that the last 20 years was the, the standard. Also, this part of California, the Owens Valley, starting from here up through to Mammoth and getting up into towards Reno, is characterized by these types of earthquakes. There have been multiple sequences with many, mag, with magnitude sevens and many large earthquakes within the sequences with these large, very active aftershock sequences. So this is uh, this is far from unusual for this area. Right, and just to, just to point out, I, just to follow along with, excuse me, excuse me, just to follow along with Dr. Jones was saying, in 1876, uh, we had an earthquake just to the north of here, the Owens, 72. or 1872, uh, Owens Valley earthquake, magnitude estimated at seven and a half to eight, so very large earthquake historically, uh, you know, maybe about 50 miles north of where this activity is occurring. So it's not in the historical record, this level of activity is not unprecedented. Okay, when we talk about these probabilities of earthquakes, 5% is the generic number. That's on average over the whole area. The ability to have uh, the, what you're going to be triggering, if we're seeing a lot of aftershocks, the numbers go up a bit just because when you have a lot of earthquakes, you tend to have a lot of earthquakes. This is an active sequence, therefore the chance of an aftershock that's bigger than the main shock goes up with the overall number. So this is probably, you know, and actually this was a 7.1, a 7.0 would technically still be an aftershock. And when we give you that one in 10 number, it does include that possibility as well. So anyway, I apologize. I, I cut you off. Do you want to? Okay. No, that was that was what I was trying to ask. I know that's a road, but can you give a more specific locator of where that is? Yeah, I, I can't. I can't give you that. Yeah, I apologize. I don't have a, a like a geo reference on that. It is uh, southwest of Trona, along Highway 178, and. I have received word that Caltrans has closed the highway. Obviously, they need to do repairs. Uh, so this is in, in a uh, uh, between Ridgecrest and Trona along Highway 178. And how close would be to yeah. Uh, so so as, as far as we can tell, right, we we just have a you know we got a a, a message. Uh, this is just a, a a text message from a geologist in the U.S. Geological Survey, and he said southwest of Trona on Highway 178. Rob is marking Highway 178, and uh, so because we have that fault structure, we also can see it's right lateral motion, so we're pretty sure it's on the northwest fault, not on the southwest trending fault. The southwest trending fault is left lateral. Can you give us a brief description of what the geologists actually do when they're out there? They're obviously out there. What does that look like? They're going out.
out. They will, will take pictures and share them with us. And then they document at this particular location, and they measured it. This is about 30 centimeters of slip, which is about one foot total offset along this. And that's one of the important pieces that will be put together is what's the offset as a function going down the fault. And they actually have very sophisticated equipment where they can, uh, okay, 4.5. Uh, um, where they can actually measure in great detail. They take out, uh, optical images or radar images of these structures and then, then they can actually digitize that and get very precise three-dimensional view of what the deformation was like. So there's going to be a, a, a wealth of data that we'll be able to look at and get a very detailed picture of what the rupture was looking for. What would your questions be about this? My questions? Well, oh, wow. What would you like to hear from that? Yeah. So there's there's actually a number of questions in terms of the ground motions that are radiated from faults. As faults break to the surface like this, there's actually indications that the ground motions are lower than they might be expected from ruptures that are buried. If you remember Dr. Jones talking about the Northridge earthquake, that was a buried fault. And it was very energetic. Even though the magnitude was 6.7, it was incredibly strong shaking. This earthquake. Portable? Uh, hold on, hold on everybody. Our mics are open now. So we are uh, dealing with this quake for right now. Uh, so that's more information. They've been able to crunch some more numbers. Uh, to note that for the 6.4 uh, that we had yesterday, prob probability that's also the case. What it looks like it broke up quake. to the surface um, uh, and the ground motions were a little bit lower than what might be expected for the average 6.4 earthquake. Now those are just preliminary uh, assessments, but that's very important if we can understand that and then be able to better forecast what might happen in the next year. And there's the other unusual point. It looks like, at least on the 6.4, the rupture moved down the fault a little more slowly than average. And maybe that contributes to the lower ground motions yes. rather than breaking through. And that's, so we, did, we don't know yet for the 7.1 how fast it ruptured down the fault. And uh, that'll help us, I think, uh, uh, address some of those pictures. And you know, if we're, if we're lucky, we'll have a different rupture propagation speed between the two events, and then we can compare how the ground motions look. What so that would be the type of thing. standing right there, would it be, appear to be opening up as one crack right away, or would you actually see it move? Yeah. We, yeah. we think you see it move. Yeah, yeah, and there's actually kind of two different or, or two uh, uh, comparable things that happen. One is the rupture, which starts at the hypocenter and goes out across the fault. And it's going very fast, uh, you know. Uh, Two miles a second. Yeah. And so if you were standing right next to the fault, you would see something that kind of went from that horizon, zoom, over to the other horizon. The second thing that's happening is that the fault is actually moving side to side. OK, so that rupture would go along. That's like a zipper. And then the fault would be going about uh, a couple feet, maybe three feet per second, sliding by. So you would see a zip, and then the two sides of the fault, you could actually see sl slide by. It may take a two or three seconds for that to happen. Last question. Have you ever seen what? these cracks big enough for a person to fall in? Oh, no, no, it's not opening up. <laughs> All right. If the fault could open up, you will not have an earthquake. You slip on the fault and produce shaking, just like snapping your fingers makes the, the air vibrate. Try making snapping your fingers with it opened up. You don't make any waves. If the fault opened, there'd be no waves coming off yeah. of it. Yeah, there are a couple of reports where people have actually, you know, witnessed the fault move, uh, very dramatic. Obviously, um, very strong shaking too. You know, you're gonna be having difficulty standing up and, and so forth. Anyway, so last question. If you gave an estimate of the likelihood of another quake above a seven, do you also have an estimate of another quake happening that's greater than this 7.1? That's just a few percent lower because greater than seven includes everything that's bigger 
it's it's on the order of eight or nine percent. So the people in Ridgecrest obviously are going to be feeling this for some time, but people down here are going to be feeling some sizable aftershocks. There's the potential, you know, all the, the, the ones that are definitely above five, the five ones, five twos, five threes, they seem to be felt if you're sitting quietly in Los Angeles. And uh, we're pretty certain we're going to have more of that size somewhere over the next few days. Lucy, you said the 6-4 quake and its aftershocks were on a southwestern type of motion. These are going northwestern. Would you expect the rest of the aftershocks to be in a northwestern direction? They'll be on both yeah. structures probably. Are you all yeah. be back here tomorrow morning? Not me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Dr. Graves, thank you. I, I so believe there will the you will yeah. this We're will be do, open. Yeah. Somebody will be here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Eleven o'clock. Tomorrow. Eleven o'clock tomorrow. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. All right. In time for okay. the next quake, right? <laughs> yeah. They're they're tired. They've been working a lot after yesterday too. Mm -hmm. So it's been a long two days. Now we do have some um, updated information from Ridgecrest. This is from the police police chief there. More than thirteen thousand people without power right now. Uh, they did have two structure fires. Those have been contained. PG&E says that gas leaks are under control. They're focusing on the residential uh, reported gas leaks, and officials were able to shut off a lot of those gas valves. Uh, they did a flyover uh, two units, and they found no major road damage was seen, uh, no additional injuries reported as of uh, the most recent uh, report. But we did see damage on highway, state route highway, or One state route 170. 178. Significant reports uh, of damage there. Uh, close half, between uh, Ridgecrest and Trona. Right, and half of the road about two feet, yeah. uh, you know, higher than the yeah. other. About a foot displacement was what uh, we were just told, and uh, you can expect that being that close to the epicenter. And uh, drivers cautioned logically. to be careful in that area, obviously. Right. So, yeah. yeah, that's what we're seeing now in terms of the quake damage from uh, the Ridgecrest area where this thing was centered. Trona is the epicenter, kind of near the epicenter, and we have uh, eyewitness news crews making their way slowly as best they can through this damaged road to get to that area. But you heard the assessment: uh, two fires, number of structures damaged, some uh, injuries, although nothing major that we have heard yet, and definitely no fatalities that we have heard of yet. And I think by now, uh, some several what three hours later, we would have heard of something by now if people had in fact died here or there had been a major building collapse. I think. We would know. Right. And we have uh, Jill who is uh, on the phone with us from Ridgecrest. Jill, what can you tell us about what you experienced tonight and what you have, what you're seeing around you now? Uh, it's pretty interesting. Um, we were at the park playing with our dogs, and uh, like we do every night, and it was weird to kind of feel the whole earth moving under your feet. Uh, we've been feeling on ton of aftershocks in the house and so you can kind of hear it coming and then the whole house starts shaking uh we got home and like a bookshelf had fallen over and the tv and the microwave and conditions had broken but other than that we've been really lucky like we cooked dinner on the gas stove and uh, our electricity and swamp heat our coolers are still working so that's pretty awesome that is great news. Are you hearing anything particular about any structure or any any one building or several buildings or locations where there is extensive damage or where people are in danger? Have you heard anything like that? Nothing where people are in danger. Um, my roommate was at a place where she said there's a fire nearby. I haven't talked to her very much, but um, I've been seeing kind of things on the news about that. And then uh, the liquor store down the road got hit pretty hard at the 6.4 and then again at the 7.1. So a lot of people have been frequenting their gas station just to kind of help out there. Mm -hmm. So that's been good, but nothing major. We've been really lucky. I can't believe it because it's a 7.1, but. Right, and what about, what, real quickly, what about the availability of gasoline? Because one of the things that can happen when the power goes out, for example, is the gas pumps don't work, and that can be a real problem for people who need gas to try to get around, get out, get somebody to, to a hospital or whatever they need to do. Are the gas stations functioning? Uh, are, 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 it sounds like gas, uh, gas is flowing in the pipes, natural gas is flowing, so you can cook. Can you, are, are gas stations working? Are, are the other kind of things that we kind of rely on for our day-to-day -day lives functioning in Ridgecrest? 
so far today, like driving around, uh, they were all working and I didn't see anything other than the house that caught on fire down the road. And then um, the liquor store is pretty damaged, but everyone was getting gas. Like there were lines and um, we've been kind of worried about that because if we need to get out, we need gas, but um, everything seems to be working right now. So it's pretty nuts how everything has, you know, stood up to the earthquake. One last question for you, Jill. Assuming you felt the one yesterday, the 6.4, and of course tonight's, we know you felt. Compare the two. Um, well, it was hard to say because we were inside in bed uh, at the 6.4, and it was pretty intense, that's for sure. I felt a lot of earthquakes, but that one was pretty gnarly. Mm -hmm. And then today at the park, we were outside, and it was just totally different being outside. Um, like the light things, light poles were shaking really bad and I was shaking too bad. My dog was kind of scared, you know, what was going on. But it was just, it's hard to say, um, the biggest and most earthquakes I've ever felt. Uh, it's pretty gnarly. Yeah. You just kind of want it to end. Absolutely. The biggest we've had in 20 years. Yep. Thank you, Jill. Thanks for talking with us. All right. Thank we, you, guys. Uh, have a good night. Thank you. You too. you, too. Wishing you the best and your family. Uh, we have Scott Reif, uh, we believe. Is it Scott over in Air 7 HD? This is Mid-City. It is, Mark. It's Wilshire Boulevard, and we have a broken water main. We still have a little water percolating up, but they've shut down Wilshire at La Jolla Avenue. From what we know at this hour, we believe the uh, the broken water main occurred right about the time of the earthquake. So, you know, we won't get that kind of information or confirmation that the earthquake may have caused this. We have so many broken water mains that type of confirmation uh, this quickly. Uh, but right now, Wilshire Boulevard is shut down. It's shut down in both directions, uh, just to the uh, east of San Vicente. Uh, not a traffic factor at this hour. Detours are good around it. That's not going to be an issue. What could be an issue, though, is these aren't easy to repair. They have to get under Wilshire Boulevard and rip up the street and then really repair a major water main in this area. Uh, that could take a long time. That could go maybe even into Monday morning's commute. It's possible. Uh, sometimes these can be pretty big project so you see a little water percolating up right there they do tell us it's a broken water main they haven't given us the size of the main at this point in time we don't believe there's anybody in this area without water but that's uh, always a possibility especially once they shut everything down they have to sort of divert it onto another line and try and keep all the residential homes in this area and some of the businesses uh, still with water but uh, the broken water main occurred uh, from the information we have right about the time of the earthquake so we'll be uh, trying to get more information uh, as time goes by if, if that may have caused or partially led to this. Uh, but um, it's the only one we've seen, so we talked about this earlier. Fortunate, we, we did uh, fly around and look for uh, folks responding or uh, emergency crews responding. We didn't see a lot of that, but we do have this broken water main, and uh, it could be a tough one to repair. You know, there was a water main break on the Miracle Mile yesterday, not too far from this one. And I wonder if those two, if one maybe led to the other. Uh, of course, That's DWP possible. can answer that question for us, and we'll be asking that question we, when we can get a hold of somebody. They're awfully busy right now. Yeah, I think so. I think it's going to be a long night ahead of us and a long week ahead uh, in light of what Lucy Jones was saying, that we're just, the likelihood that we will feel many more aftershocks mm -hmm. uh, is, is very real and uh, some very large ones, too. She said the, the percentage changed as, she, as, you know, they got more information, but initially they were saying 11% chance of a magnitude 7 quake happening over the next week. Mm -hmm. That's 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 significant, and that's that true. is very unsettling. And then she said a 50 to 60% chance of a magnitude 6 quake. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think we might all be on edge over the next few days. We will indeed. Eileen yeah. Frere live for us now in the city of Norwalk. She has been talking with people there, how they're dealing with the quake. What is the situation? Do they have power? Is everything okay there, Eileen? Well, at this point, Mark and Giovanna, we're outside the AMC theaters, uh, and we talked with a number of people who were inside their movie about to start. All of a sudden, uh, everything started moving. They felt their chairs moving. 
they said everybody got quiet. They started looking at each other, and people were starting to say, I think it's an earthquake. And sure enough, it was. We were also in uh, uh, Buena Park and Anaheim. Talked to many people there who uh, experienced the quake in Buena Park at a car dealership at, at uh, Buena Park Honda. Uh, they were inside talking with customers when that quake hit. I believe we have some sound to play for you of their reaction. It was just all of a sudden just shaking like, is this another earthquake? Yes, it is. Okay, everybody, you know, pretty much just get out of the building. Look over, you can see the windows like shaking. Come out here, we look at uh, the street lights and you can see those moving back and forth. And it's just like, okay, what do you do? I haven't been in one in a long time, so. That's pretty much that one. Well, I was in a car, and I thought at first, like, the car just kind of messed up a little bit. I'm like, hey, what is this? And I kind of got out, and I'm looking around, and there's people around me going, is that an earthquake? I'm like, yeah. I'm like, that's an earthquake. It was definitely a little more rolly than yesterday, you know? Yesterday was a little more, like, it kind of jolted at first. Like, today it felt like it was just, like, rolling kind of weird. And did it, li and it was two separate ones you felt? There was. The first one lasted, like, I don't know, like, 20 seconds, something like that, and the second one definitely was over a minute. I mean, that was... Like it just didn't stop. Like we were just, I'm just like sitting there, like, like when is this gonna stop? Like how big is this thing? And again, those were some workers at Buena Park Honda where they experienced the quake. We also talked with a resident who uh, was home when the quake hit, and he said it went on for so long, and and it said it was more like being in a boat with the waves rolling. He said he actually felt a little sick after and had to kind of get his footing uh, to stand up. But he went and took cover along with his mother when that quake hit. Uh, obviously, lasting so long, they just didn't know, uh, you know, if this was the big one. So they took cover. Uh, they also um, stressed to us, that person we talked with, that uh, we should all be prepared. Obviously, we say it all the time, but this really brings it home to have water, have supplies, be ready uh, if this were to be a catastrophic event, to be prepared in case it is the big one, that you can uh, survive on your own. Um, and other people stressing to us uh, that there is CERT training. It's free in many communities. Uh, people in your neighborhood uh, may have this training already so that if a, a major event, a catastrophe happens, you know what to do. Just some things that come to mind when we have a quake of this magnitude. Reporting live from North Norwalk, Eileen Frayer, ABC 7 Eyewitness News. Okay, Eileen, thank you. So many of us will remember where we were when this quake hit. Uh, some of us were at work. I was off work today. I was at the Dodger game with my family, and it was the fourth inning. Kike Hernandez at bat when uh, things started shaking. And it was interesting that the game didn't really stop for a, a few seconds. While that quake was happening, people were starting to go, hey, what is this? Talking amongst themselves, kind of a shout went out among the crowd. But you saw two pitches happen, and then the umpire goes, no, wait a minute. There's an earthquake happening here. Stopped, paused the play for a second. Uh, and then uh, what I thought was pretty, you know, we were all kind of wondering, you know, is this happening, and is it going to get any worse? And we were sitting in, at the field level underneath the, the mezzanine level. Mm -hmm. So right above us, of course, the is the overhang. And I'm watching that kind of move a little bit. And I'm a little bit, you know, my wife and I are looking at each other. What are we going to do? Right. We're going to run out onto the field if this gets worse. What's going to happen? Uh, and you could kind of feel that vertigo. Yes. It was kind of a rolling motion. And you could see the foul poles moving around a little bit. Funniest part is that after the quake kind of ended, of course, the play continued. Uh, the organist got on the organ and played Carol's King, that Carol King song, I Feel the Earth Move Under My Feet. <laughs> Everybody got kind of a good laugh, but people funny. were a little tense there for a while. Here's uh, Dodger manager Dave Roberts uh, talking about uh, what he experienced. I didn't really know what was going on. There was, uh, we really couldn't feel it uh, as much on the field as the guys, as the people in the upper deck. So there was a lot of commotion going on. and. Um, so I didn't really understand what was going on, but then I got word quickly what it was. So hopefully, uh, I think the epicenter was in the same area, so hopefully um, people are okay. And um, Dodger Stadium held up. It did, but there were some nervous people, definitely. And mm -hmm. I, of course, had to leave because I had to come here and right. uh, work and deal with the news. And right. I had to leave. Uh, my wife and uh, some friends of ours and our daughter and a couple of our, our daughter's friends, but everybody got out okay. The, the outcome of the game, uh, not so great, but uh, maybe, you know, Rob can talk about that a little bit later. All, All right. right, Mark, thank you. We're going to check in with um, our sister station in Fresno and uh, listen in. 
mom reached out to you here yeah. about that yeah. one. Yeah. Your mom's in Ireland, I assume. Yeah, uh, I'm in Ireland, so for some reason. Thank you so much for speaking with me. You guys will be safe out there. So I just heard these two guys, uh, both from Ireland, they are here uh, visiting. They were up at Lake Tahoe. They stopped here uh, in Ridgecrest just to get a bite to eat at the local McDonald's here uh, when that earthquake happened. Okay, we can't... We we can't hear them uh, too well. Um, I, I will. I, I do want to add that the Red Cross shelter is open in Ridgecrest, uh, providing service to those affected by tonight's earthquake. And we're going to try to get uh, some information and find out if uh, if people are actually using uh, the Red Cross shelter there. Right. Yeah. We were hearing that people in the city of Trona were actually trying to get out of town. They may be hampered by the fact that Highway 178 is closed. Let's get to Joy Rand. He has been uh, out there in uh, the Santa Clarita Valley for much of the evening, where people felt that quake strongly. He joins us now with a report. Jory? Yeah, second day in a row, Valencia residents were able to feel a rather large earthquake tonight. Many of them were out on a Friday night at the movie theater here. It was a packed house, uh, Spider-Man in theaters. Everyone we talked to coming out of the theater was watching that same movie. They say once the earthquake hit, everyone in the theater felt it. Oftentimes, groups would stand up often with children in tow and leave the theater. Many of them returned. Some did not. We spoke with one young man who heard a young girl behind him having a panic attack and he sprang into action. Take a listen. Uh, so I had a friend in high school who had, who was prone to panic attacks, and um, this girl two rows behind me was. I suddenly heard someone like breathing really hard, and I turned around and I saw noticed this girl having a panic attack. So um, I looked around, I lo made eye contact with her, and I said, "Are you having a panic attack?" She she wasn't sure, so I said, "Start counting backwards from 10," um, and she was in the middle of a panic attack, so she couldn't really like. It's kind of hard to understand uh, what people are saying to you so I climbed up and over the rows um, and uh, put my hand on her and I was like okay count backwards from 10 with me and we slowly uh, counted back from 10 uh, taking deeper breaths in and out before each turn. Wow good job. Yeah. Was it scary for you guys or are you kind of used to it? Um, it was actually pretty scary for us. Um, we're not very used to those big earthquakes because we actually just moved here but um, since it was so close we've been having them all um, the last couple of days so it was actually pretty scary. Yeah, a lot of rattled nerves here and beyond. We spoke to a, a group of parents who were drinking, uh, having dinner while their daughter was in the movie theater. She texted from inside the theater and was checking on the parents who seemed a lot calmer than the young, the young woman was inside the theater. So uh, kind of mixed feelings here. A lot of people feel like they've been through this before. It wasn't that strong. One woman told us she wasn't worried at all. Other people got up and left the movie theater entirely, weren't able to enjoy their night. We were actually, we began our night in San Marino, about 30 miles to the southeast of where we are now. And we were inside our news truck at the time, which was rocking for a solid 15 to 20 seconds down there. We, we began to make our way up here. We saw video of Valencia of a backyard pool that was uh, losing water left and right. We spoke with another man who was at a movie theater uh, just a short ways away here in Santa Clarita. They said that movie theater officially evacuated, took everybody out. This was done by management before letting everybody back in here in Valencia. That did not happen at this theater, though some people did self evacuate. But that's the latest from here in Valencia. Jory Rand, ABC 7 Eyewitness News. Okay, Jory, thank you. We are awaiting a press conference by state officials from the office, <clears throat> excuse me, the Office of Emergency Services to brief us on the state response to this earthquake, this series uh, of earthquakes that have happened over the last 24 hours. Let's listen in. Oh, well, he's doing mic okay. checks right We're now. Not he's quite ready, ready for us. For it. Not quite ready for us uh, at this point. Um, you can expect the state response to be robust. Uh, they are sending uh, uh, resources there as best they can to keep the power on, to keep the lights on. Caltrans, of course, is being called upon to fix that road, Highway 178. There was a crack in it yesterday. It's a lot worse today. Uh, as you can see, about a foot displacement of that highway. That's a key road between uh, the, the, the city of Trona, Trona and, Ridge and Ridgecrest. Crest. They're about 11 miles apart, mm -hmm. but we're understanding that the people of Trona, at least according to a report from Leticia Juarez, she spoke to someone from there earlier, right. that the people in Trona really felt this very strongly and were actually trying to get away uh, in their cars uh, on the highway.
Yes, trying to get out of there as best they can yeah. and hampered by the fact that the highway is pretty badly damaged. So that's going to be a, a top priority there. Uh, people who might need to rebuild are going to be interested in finding out what sort of disaster relief uh, material or, or, or funding is available to them. Uh, a little bit far ahead of the game right now. At this point, it's about making sure everyone is safe. And that effort is going on. Officials there in the city of Ridge, Ridgecrest, uh, city fire, uh, city police, uh, county sheriffs, first responders of all stripes are there keeping an eye on things and making sure that everyone is safe. Until we get uh, to that press conference from uh, state officials, we're going to check in with Sid Garcia, who is at the Americana tonight. Sid. You know, it was an interesting evening. We had just pulled up from Ridgecrest, and as I was putting my bag in the trunk of my car, I suddenly felt something. The light standard in the parking lot started to sway, and I thought, oh, no, here we go again. So we immediately came here, me and sports producer Dejo, everybody's, it's all hands on deck. Folks were telling us they felt it. Take a listen. Uh, while I was at the bar, uh, we felt the, uh, the rolling. And uh, everybody paused for a second and, uh, well, well, yeah, well, we're having an earthquake. Uh, I looked at my wife and I pulled everybody because there's... Uh, we were sitting against a brick wall, a brick wall and I wall, said, uh, we should probably move yeah. before these bricks kill us. <laughs> and he said, let's move to the center of the bar. And uh, we did. Yeah. <laughs> you knew right away what it was. Yeah. And Mark we, said we should go outside. We were actually at, at home. And uh, then we start feeling shaking and everything, and then it's her first experience of because she's visiting from uh, Europe, and then it was her first experience of earthquake, so uh, she was freaking out a bit. <laughs> then, okay. What did it feel like for you? It was just moving from side to side, you know, and we live on the fourth floor, so I think we could feel it more than than down here. Scary. Yeah. <laughs> You know, we actually came across one guy tonight who said he didn't feel a thing. He didn't feel at all as he was having dinner at the Americana with friends. Everyone we talked to tonight just it rattled some nerves. Even those who have gone through several earthquakes, they were like, okay, one yesterday, one today, rattled some nerves. But you know what? Everybody we talked to checked in with family and relatives to make sure they were okay. And again, I said this when we were up in Ridgecrest earlier in the day. This is a Reminder, are you ready for an earthquake? Are you ready with water, food, and supplies for at least three days? Because that's up to how much you're going to need before utilities go back on. But out here, no reports of any damage, just nerves being rattled a little bit. But everybody went on about their business. As one guy told us, guys, I got to go catch a movie. Went on a normal Friday night. Live in Glendale, I'm Sid Garcia. ABC 7 Eyewitness News. Back to you guys in the studio. All right, Sid, thank you. That is uh, the good news is that people are able to return to their routines mm -hmm. and, uh, and entertain to, to, to see a movie, and that is great. But some people we know watching movies earlier were disrupted, and they mm -hmm. actually left movie theaters. So Yeah, it kind yeah. of depends on your, your, <clears throat> whether you've dealt with this before, what your feelings are about yeah. earthquakes. And, uh, you know, it was interesting. Dr. Lucy Jones yesterday was talking about how, you know, after that 6.4, that it was, you know, that, that there had been a foreshock to that and that the main quake was a 6.4 and there was a very slim likelihood that there would be anything larger or even as big that would follow it. And I think the assumption was, OK, that was it. We're done. We're going to feel something along uh, along the size of a six, maybe uh, you know, in, in in the next few days or weeks, which is kind of what is the typical pattern. And then, of right. course, this happens today, and I guess that maybe is what rattled people even more: the fact that this was uh, not the sort of typical pattern that one sees. That the foreshock would be preceded by, you know, 24, 30, you know, almost 30, 36, 30 hours or so right. uh, before the main shock. That's not uh, a fairly typical thing. And that the 7.1 is 10 times stronger than that 6.4. And the other thing she said that was interesting is that actually we are returning to normal mm -hmm. Southern California earthquake behavior. Right. Uh, we had just had a period, a very quiet period over the last 20 years. But she said that, that typically Southern California has a 7.1 or something close yeah. Yeah. every, did she say, five to 10 years? 
All right. Yeah. Scott Reif now over downtown Los Angeles. It looks beautiful on this uh, 5th of July night, having gone through this quake. As it propagated toward L.A., it felt more like a three or four range. That's why here in L.A. it didn't feel quite as bad as it did out there in the high desert. Let's get more from Scott Reif in Air 7 HD. Scott? Yeah, Mark and Giovanna, isn't that a beautiful shot? You know, we've got some overcast that moved in. It, it, it didn't really look like it was going to tonight, but it formed over the Santa Monica Mountains. And thank goodness, it's such a calm night here. We we're certainly uh, so very fortunate that that earthquake didn't cause much in the way of damage. Now, moments ago, I want to show you video we just shot a few moments ago. We did that broken water main we talked about, and you should see the video playing here. It's uh, on Wilshire Boulevard, about the 6300 block, right at La Jolla Avenue. So Wilshire shut down in both directions. Uh, the water main, according to the information that we have, happened right about the time of the earthquake. Uh, so it could be related, but uh, we don't know that for certain at this point in time. Uh, but that's going to be shut down certainly for tomorrow and it could be throughout the weekend and maybe even the next week depending on how serious it is they've shut it down at this point and only a little bit of water is percolating up through there we'll come back out to a live shot and show you downtown once again look at the u.s bank building you see some of that fog rolling through uh would like to let you know and everybody know that in encino we watched the lights come back on so the power was restored in that uh, i don't know four or five block area in encino that was without power the dodger game is over unfortunately i think I think they lost three to two to the Padres. We're able to fly over downtown now. You know, there's a TFR in place, uh, flight restrictions when they're actually playing. Uh, so aircrafts, uh, not even uh, we can get a permission to fly overhead. But the weather conditions right now are eerily uh, similar to what they were uh, when uh, in 94, when I got airborne uh, right after that earthquake and the whole San Fernando Valley was black. So it, it's just so fortunate, we are so fortunate uh, at this point in time that we have not seen uh, emergency crews responding to anything that was earthquake related and nothing in the way of injury. So, uh, you know, we have to be so thankful for that. We are indeed. And, uh, you know, as you were flying over Staples Center, I guess um, we might as well break the news, shouldn't we? It's, it's been out <laughs> on social media. I think it's out. Media. It absolutely. It's out. <laughs> Kawhi Leonard going to the Clippers. Kawhi Leonard wow. will be going to the Clippers. That is, uh, I, I guess it. you could call it the sports quake tonight. Uh, That's big. All right, here's the uh, state Love officials that. now. Oh. I'm going to give you a quick uh, overview of the situation in um, Kern County in the city of Red, uh, Ridgecrest. Um, uh, as you know, over the last couple of days, there have been a series of earthquakes that, that uh, have occurred. Uh, in the Ridgecrest Ridge area, specifically around uh, China Lake uh, Naval uh, Station. And um, uh, tonight, around 8.20, um, um, there was a, a, a second very large quake, uh, magnitude 7.1. Um, the, the quake did uh, last for some time. It was felt widely throughout, uh, well, most of Southern California and even as far north here, uh, as Sacramento. Um, the uh, shaking intensity was very significant. Um, looking at our, um, our algorithms uh, uh, run through what we call our HAZUS, uh, our hazard, hazard analysis um, algorithm, um, the, the shaking intensity was at its highest level in and around um, China Lake and uh, uh, just adjacent to the town of Red, uh, Ridgecrest. Uh, we have significant reports of uh, um, uh, fires, uh, structure fires, mostly uh, as a result of uh, gas uh, leaks or gas um, line breaks. Uh, there are gas line breaks throughout the, the city. There are also reports of water main breaks. Uh, power is out and communications is out uh, to parts of the community. Um, as well, uh, south of Ridgecrest in, in San Bernardino County, the town of Trona, a uh, small community of about um, uh, 2,000. Uh, there are reports of also some uh, building collapse and uh, power out, power outages and some gas leaks there as well. Um, uh, we'll give you briefings from the various agencies that are represented uh, behind me to talk about uh, um, conditions on our roads and, and uh, some of the other impacts. Here uh, at the State Operations Center, we are fully activated at the highest level. Earlier tonight, uh, Governor Newsom 
uh, did talk to the White House and requested a, a presidential emergency declaration uh, to support our operations here in the state and provide federal assets and what we call direct federal assistance in support of all of the mutual aid assets that we are currently um, uh, providing to mostly Kern County and some to San Bernardino County. Um, Governor uh, Newsom activated the State Operations Center at its highest level tonight um, and um, provided really right now um, a significant amount of fire and rescue mutual aid from the Los Angeles, um, uh, Riverside, San Bernardino, um, and Fresno County areas uh, to include urban search and rescue teams, fire strike teams, firefighters, uh, hazardous materials response units, uh, emergency medical services, ambulance strike teams, um, and um, uh, uh, personnel. In fact, roughly over 100 um, mutual aid personnel have been dispatched uh, in support of these uh, various fires and, and, and the uh, support of the, both Trona and uh, the town of Ridgecrest. Um, it's important to note that Ridgecrest and Trona are both very remotely located. Uh, on the eastern side of the Sierra, and um, uh, the, the roads have been impacted, and getting resources into the area continues to be uh, a challenge. It, it is um, w a little bit of a benefit that, um, you know, just two days ago there was a 6.4 earthquake that occurred there, and we had a number of resources already deployed in the area in support of Kern County. Uh, we were able to then turn those resources around uh, they had just been released shortly before the 7.1 and allowed us to have a, uh, a, a pretty significant amount of resources available uh, almost immediately. Uh, we have been in contact with both the, the mayor of um, the, the uh, uh, city of Ridge, Ridgecrest, uh, both myself and Governor Newsom have uh, talked to the mayor, uh, talked to the police chief. Uh, we've talked to the county of Kern fire chief and we've talked to San Bernardino County. Um, uh, and are coordinating here at the State Operations Center with all the state agencies, uh, as well as those county departments to ensure that uh, any resources that they need um, are, are being uh, provided. Um, huge priorities right now for medical support and for firefighting and for emergency power. Um, we have been in contact with uh, private sector utilities both the uh, water department, um, our gas and electrical utility providers to ensure that uh, they have enough resources to try to get water and power up and restored as, as fast as possible. Uh, the, the, the quake happened at roughly around um, uh, uh, 8.20 tonight. And so uh, it got dark pretty fast and um, situational awareness is, is um, sketchy because you know the power's out and there's not a lot of lighting so we know that as the day breaks we'll be able to get a better assessment of the total amount of damage uh, and uh, uh, throughout the night tonight though we are working to move assets and resources in place or into staging areas um, uh, so that we can have those resources immediately available in the morning um, uh, in those communities as necessary. So um, with that, I'm going to um, turn it over to uh, several speakers uh, behind me. They're going to brief on what their, um, their agencies and departments are working on, uh, and then I'll come back and answer any uh, questions you may have. So I'm going to first turn it over uh, to Deputy Commissioner of the Highway Patrol, uh, Scott Silsby. Good evening. I'll be really brief. Just as a reminder, it's a really remote area. Uh, the good news is that it being the holiday weekend, most um, all law enforcement and EMS had ramped up and had extra resources available, so that's very helpful. Um, as far as CHP responsibilities, uh, quite a few of us are out there on the, uh, handling the road closures with Caltrans. And uh, from there, our folks peel off and go check the structural integrity of overpasses and roadways with Caltrans. And so far, other than what uh, Director Kim's going to tell you, we're hearing pretty good news. Um, from there, they, uh, their secondary mission is to assist the local law enforcement. So um, right now I'm hearing that the calls for service have dropped considerably and that uh, most of the calls are, are being covered pretty well. Um, so as uh, the director said, when daylight comes, we did have aircraft up too, but couldn't see a whole lot. So when daylight comes, we'll have a much better idea of what's needed. 
But uh, the good news is, is um, the resources there are handling uh, the situation well, and um, there's more resources going in in the morning. So uh, I'll be ready for any questions if you have any. Next, I'm going to turn it over to Major General David Baldwin, uh, the Adjutant General of the California National Guard. <clears throat> Thanks, Commissioner. California Military Department is mobilizing and deploying a joint task force to the impacted area that will include about 200 security forces, sustainment troops, which are logistical support, and aviation assets, including helicopters from the Army National Guard and cargo aircraft from California's Air National Guard. We've also alerted the remainder of the California Military Department, so all of the California Army National Guard, the Air National Guard, and our state California State Guard in the event additional resources are required. I've also spoken with officials at the Pentagon, so if we need any help from out of state, from the active component, or from any other state's National Guard, that help will be on its way. I'll be followed by Chief Tom Porter from CAL FIRE. Uh, CAL FIRE is uh, prepared to uh, respond with any of the state's resources uh, that we have and, and uh, that might be needed for this. Uh, as of now, uh, we see that uh, fire potential is, is pretty low for this week weekend or moderate, and so we'll be able to uh, use some of those resources uh, from the California's fire department to uh, meet any needs that are uh, unmet. Uh, also, our Office of the State Fire Marshal is working with the uh, liquid pipe uh, and fuel um, providers to ensure that the, their pipelines are safety through our pipeline safety uh, program. So, I will be followed by David Kim, uh, Secretary of Transportation Agency. Thank you very much. I'd like to update you on the status of three roadways. Uh, the first is State Route 178. Uh, there is significant damage on 178 as a result of a rock slide uh, across both lanes near Lake Isabella. Uh, there are also severe cracks in the roadway uh, just outside the township of Trona. And this is uh, very close to the location where cracks were discovered as a result of yesterday's event, which were repaired quickly uh, within a few hours by Caltrans maintenance crews. Um, there is a full closure of State Route 70, 178 in two different locations. I'll read them to you. Um, from the San Bernardino Kern County line to 14.7 miles east of the San Bernardino Kern County line, there is an additional full closure uh, at 4.1 miles east of the junction at State Route 184 in Kern Canyon uh, due to the rock slide. The, uh, the cracks on 178 will be filled by Caltrans maintenance crews with cold mix asphalt. A couple of other uh, routes that were impacted were State Route 127 and State Route 190. The, there were rock slides on both routes tonight. They have both been cleared and both route roads are now open. And I will now be followed by Health and Human Services. Good evening, Marco Meach, Deputy Secretary at the California Health and Human Services Agency. We have fully activated uh, and have deployed resources uh, both at the Emergency Medical Services Authority, the California Department of Public Health, and the California Department of Social Services. We're in close contact with all of the healthcare facilities in the region and have been in communication with them to ensure that they have all the resources they need to take care of the patients that, they're, that they have in those facilities. Um, and we also are working with the sheltering task force here within the state operation Center through our Department of Social Services. Thank you. Um, before I take questions, I'll say um, earlier tonight as well, uh, we had a conversation with uh, FEMA, uh, FEMA Region 9 Administrator. Um, FEMA is now um, present here at the State Operations Center, and uh, as a result of the governor's request to uh, the White House, uh, of uh, FEMA activating uh, two incident management teams from um, from Northern California in support of this operation. Right now, um, our big concern obviously is that um, it, it got dark fast, so good situational awareness of the total amount of impact um, is is where where we're really um, you know looking to 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 get uh, better fidelity on when the light comes up. In, in anticipation of a need and, um, you know, in our discussions, preliminary discussions with both the police chief and the mayor, 
we know that there's been quite a bit of damage and we know that there's been a lot of impact. So we are moving resources from these various agencies and departments that are represented here uh, into staging area to get them as close as possible uh, into the uh, theater of operation, mainly because it is such a remote area. Um, and um, really, it, it, the, the state is really positioning itself to ensure that um, direction of Governor Newsom that we have every uh, available asset um, uh, put in the right place and available to respond in for, uh, uh, whether they need it tonight to get there, uh, but definitely uh, at first light um, as resources are needed. If they're not needed, then we can we can scale back and and um, and redeploy them or de demobilize them. The, f the key, though, here is that this was a very large earthquake, and uh, we also know there's going to be a series of aftershocks as a result of of the main quake. Uh, so we want to prepare ourselves and being able to have. Um, those resources in place as the days go on here. Uh, this is not going to be something that's going to be over right away. Uh, we're, 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 we will be in 24-7 operations here at the State o uh, Operations Center uh, in support of the counties uh, until um, the situation is fully mitigated. So with that, happy to answer any questions that anybody may have. Um, were there any injuries reported? There, there have been a number of injuries reported. Um, don't have a total number of injuries. I don't know of, of count on injuries or fatalities. Um, we have not had any reports of fatalities yet, but we do know that there have been injuries. Um, there's been an, a significant uh, increased number of EMS calls um, to the 911 centers. Uh, and uh, in talking with the police chief, um, you know, there's been requests for a strike team of ambulances. Um, as well as the, the fire units that are on scene have been doing emergency medical care of individuals who may have been, been injured by the, uh, a, lot of, a lot of falling debris uh, or what I would say non-structural items falling and, and injuring uh, individuals. Can you repeat the main priorities? You mentioned medical support, firefighting, and Yeah, so our, our, our main uh, priorities are going to be in support of the counties are, are uh, continuing to protect lives and property and environment through providing mutual aid assets for fire, emergency medical uh, services, hazardous materials. Um, we are concerned this area does have a lot of pipelines going through it and, and uh, uh, that we want to ensure that um, we have enough hazardous materials response. We'll continue to coordinate emergency response operations both for state agencies and with our federal partners uh, in support of what the local governments need. Um, uh, we're going to be making sure we can get critical infrastructure back up as soon as possible. Those are the lifelines, water, power, gas service, um, uh, and uh, making sure wastewater and those kinds of things are all fully operational. We, we are concerned about um, there's a hospital that's been impacted and there's a number of care facilities. Um, and um, uh, uh, we want to make sure that those, those, um, those facilities and those individuals, those vulnerable populations are needs are met and we want to take that into account. That'll continue to be a priority for us. Um, and then we just want to make sure that the, the, the public continue to stay, remain informed of uh, what, what to do and to know that there's going to be aftershocks to prepare for those aftershocks. Um, uh, we suspect that individuals may not want to go back into their homes uh, initially, so sheltering operations will continue to be a primary focus for us in, in support of what um, but what the local government is doing. Red Cross is, has already been engaged. We are um, providing additional support with um, several thousand gallons of uh, liters of water, uh, cots, comfort kits, um, uh, sheltering supplies, and also ADA compliant uh, bedding for individuals who may need that. And FEMA has also supported several thousand commodities as well that they're staging at uh, Edwards Air Force Base. Um, and uh, we'll just continue to meet any un unmet needs moving forward. So those are really going to be our continued priorities in the next 24 to 48 hours. Um, I know you mentioned that some people are leaving tomorrow morning. I didn't know they're from here. At what time is that? So there's, there's people that are deploying there now. We're staging them in close. So there'll be people leaving all through tonight and tomorrow, and, uh, and they're coming from all over the state of California. We're deploying them. Many of them are closest resources, like fire and, and emergency medical and search and rescue. Uh, but they're, but you know, members of the National Guard and other, other uh, uh, state forces are being deployed uh, from throughout the state from tonight through tomorrow, uh, and pretty much from most of the day tomorrow until 
the situation is mitigated and the resources aren't needed any longer. Okay, any other questions? Okay, great. Well, we'll have another follow-up uh, uh, press conference in the morning around uh, 10 or 11 tomorrow. So, thank you very much. All right. So now we know that there has been damage, and it looks like uh, it, it could be significant damage throughout the area of Ridgecrest and Trona. We uh, just heard from officials, state officials, that uh, items, there have been reports of items falling on people, uh, a lot of uh, ambulance calls, uh, strike teams on the scene. for allowing us access there today and also to this. Okay, now we have a news conference from Kern County officials. Let's listen in. Uh, we had just had briefings as we came out of the field today, we being myself and Janice Hernandez from the California Geological Survey. Uh, with support from the California Highway Patrol, we were able to do aerial reconnaissance of what we call the surface fault rupture. When an earthquake happens, our sensor network picks that up and of course uh, we automatically locate and get that information out to everybody immediately. We also then follow that up and in larger earthquakes like the 6.4 and now the 7.1, we also look for fault surface rupture. This is how we confirm which fault the earthquake occurred on. So we'll see a pattern of aftershocks and we'll have a hunch about which fault that's on, but until we get eyes on it, that's when we confirm. So today we were out by air and also on the ground looking uh, for surface fault rupture on a previously mapped fault. Uh, we did find fault surface rupture both out of the base on Highway 178 where you had seen images from last night and then also uh, that rupture continues from that point on Highway 178. It also continues to the northeast and to the southwest. Uh, this is a somewhat atypical type of earthquake in Southern California. We've seen these before though. Uh, these are on what we call cross faults. So these are faults that are against the grain of the main San Andreas Fault system. So the San Andreas Fault is running from northwest to southeast through the state like a big di diagonal cut. And then against it, perpendicular to it, are this other set of faults in some places and we call those cross faults. So uh, what's typical is to have your bigger earthquakes on the faults that are oriented like the San Andreas Fault that are moving right laterally. What's less typical is a cross fault rupture that's left lateral. So when the 6.4 6 occurred, that rupture was on a cross fault as well as a portion of the main fault. And now the 7.1 is on the main fault. We've seen that main shock is just northwest of that intersection. So we know rupture went toward the northwest. It also went toward the southeast. Our geologists have been out in the field this evening and confirmed fault surface rupture uh, farther to the east on 178. So we know that that fault broke where we're seeing the aftershocks along it. Tomorrow we're hoping to get in the air again to do reconnaissance and look for surface faulting associated with the new main shock, the 7.1. That's about it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Hudnut. Now we would like to turn our attention to the city of Ridgecrest, Mayor Breeden. Thank you all for coming. I would like to say a few words to our own citizens. Many of them have experienced something that is very traumatic, somewhat unknown to most of them, and many of them are sleeping outside tonight. I. Uh, I know that it is a difficult situation, but they're fearful to be in their homes, and we are offering any services, as, as noted earlier, we have uh, places for people to shelter here, but many are choosing to just be with their neighbors, both in their sidewalks, in their driveways, and some of them are in the streets. We're asking everyone to drive safely, be careful, Look, watch for these people and understand that we are doing the very best we can. It is not an impossible task to take care of all this, but it is going to be a longer task than we thought the other day. So I thank you all for coming. I appreciate the consideration that you're going to give to the citizens of our community. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Breeden. 
Uh, we also have with us today Kern County First District Supervisor Mick Gleason, who will be able to speak with us as well. Thanks. Thank you all for being here. Uh, special uh, thanks to the first responders, all of them that have uh, uh, performed so brilliantly in the past uh, day or two. It's been a phenomenal uh, experience to watch these guys and gals get together and uh, work together and uh, with such dedication and such uh, devotion to helping this uh, community out. Uh, I've had a lot of conversations in the past couple of days. I've talked with uh, the White House. I've talked with uh, Senator Feinstein, Senator Harris. I've talked with the governor. Uh, everybody's fully engaged in what we're doing and understands our situation and is trying to uh, give us as much support as, as they possibly can. I toured the base today in the city with uh, Congressman McCarthy, who's fully engaged, Senator, Gro uh, Senator Grove and uh, Assemblyman Fong. So everybody's engaged, and we're all over this thing, and we're looking forward to uh, its rapid conclusion. As soon as Mother Nature stops uh, hounding us, I guess we'll... We'll, we'll put this to bed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Supervisor Gleason. And as he mentioned, we, we have representatives here as well from uh, Senator uh, Shannon Grove's office. We have representatives here from uh, Bakersfield City Fire Department, uh, Los Angeles County Fire Department. So there are many resources that are pouring in to help this community. So at this time, we'd like to go ahead and open it up to questions briefly before we go to the breakout of the one-on-ones. What are we calling the epicenter? We were on 171 when the quake hit. We had just passed the fissure. We felt the ground move. We went about eight miles east, and we were about two to the town of Trona, and it the ground shook, the hills came alive. Were we on the epicenter? Where? Who would know where the epicenter is? We were with geologists out there. Uh, they were analyzing that first fissure, and then the, the ground broke where we were driving. Is that a new so that's fault? A but in essence, uh, where was the epicenter? Is that something that we can state uh, officially that we know at this point? Yeah, let's go ahead and do that then. Ken Station, there we go. Ken Hudna, U.S. Geological Survey. Uh, the information about the epicenters gets updated continuously, so people are checking the automated locations, and that gets updated through time. Uh, and also you notice the magnitudes bounce around just a little. So uh, that's just normal. So the epicenter of the main shock, when I was doing this before, the 6.4 where it intersects the northwest southeast oriented fault, the epicenter of the main shock is just about here. It's in a remote part of the base. Uh, I don't have any place name to give it a name right now. Uh, we're not going to call the name of the fault that it's on until we get eyes on that. Hopefully tomorrow we'll confirm which fault ruptured. Uh, as to uh, information source, Caltech is the definitive Southern California Seismic Network operator and U.S. Geological Survey works in partnership with them in Pasadena. The website you want is scsn.org, Southern California Seismic Network.org. Also... Also, earthquakes.usgs.gov. So those maps allow you to interact, zoom in, zoom out, put satellite imagery, topo, you know, and you can get all the information right there. Ken, for all the people who are going to be listening who are out there tonight in front of their homes or in their homes, what reasonably can they expect in the way of seismic activity over the next 12 to 18 hours? What should they be expecting, anticipating, or be concerned about in that time? Please, as not technically as possible. I'm going to give a quick sketch of the basics, but also point you in the direction of the official USGS aftershock forecast. If you search on that, you'll find it for details. Uh, but basically, for a 7.1, people should be expecting at least one 6.1 magnitude or higher, uh, and at least 10 5.1 magnitude or higher. And you've been feeling them roll through. We're getting plenty. I don't know the detailed stats on how that breaks down as to how it matches up with expectation, but we'll be also adjusting the official aftershock forecast as we go through this. Chief, if you would, based on the information that you just got from USGS, what would you advise people to do and prepare in their homes and what they're doing to get through this next period with all these shocks that probably will be coming in the next 12 to 18 hours? 
Okay, so the question that has been posed is, uh, what is the safety message for the residents of Ridgecrest? Uh, what should they be preparing to do? Right. <clears throat> well, obviously, um, there are concerns. Children, uh, small children, um, obviously are, are frightened with these, so um, making sure that they're safe. I would probably start taking some stuff off of the walls if there, it's not already down um, and in high places. Make sure that there's you're not sleeping under something that's still um, hung up. And uh, we can't forget about the pets. The pets are uh, extremely uh, nervous during this time frame. Um, and then uh, make sure that uh, you have plenty of supplies. Um, when the stores are open and, and things like that. Make sure that you're stocking up just in case that we have something bigger than we had today and it's, uh, you know, stuff starts crumbling and these stores can't get back open. We need to make sure that, uh, and, and if we can't get to you right away, you have to be able to take care of yourself for a, a period of time. So um, I know that uh, we all preach that uh, we need to be prepared, and I know it's difficult that we always say we will, but now's the time. So uh, prepare yourself, um, especially for the next, I would say, week, two weeks. Um, this isn't going to stop in the near future. Um, as we know, uh, the aftershocks, they haven't slowed down since the 7-1. Uh, there for a period of time, it seemed like it just kept there was a constant vibration, so um, be prepared. Yes, ma'am. Oh, sir, sure. um, oh, sir. Nurse and I came to LA 5. We were on our way to Trona, mm -hmm. and people told us that they had little water, that their tank was not filling up for the city, mm -hmm. and that they only had a day worth of water for their children, for themselves. Now that road there that we were on mm -hmm. is buckled, it's shut down. Mm -hmm. How are they going to get water, and what do they need to do? Or you, you, if they, some of them don't even have power, but if they yeah. can, you Okay. Um, actually, we had just put out on Facebook, we were currently working that issue, trying to help them. It is a different county, um, but they are our neighbors and we care about them. Uh, many of our men and women work out there, so we do care. Um, there's a stack of water sitting over there that people have donated that we can't get to them now. Um, so it is an issue. We can't get there, obviously. Um, I do know that they have a cruise en route. I can't speak a lot about what's going on there because I don't know. I do know they have help in route, and uh, um, let's hope they get the help that they need. And uh, obviously, we would provide what we can. But uh, right now, our concern is here. Chief, I don't know if this would be best addressed to the fire chief or to the supervisor. If both of you could step forward for a minute. Do you have any kind of a clue or any kind of a timetable on when we might expect additional resources from the state of California or a supervisor from Washington, perhaps FEMA or anything else coming in here? Have you been apprised of any kind of a timeline? So the question that has been posed is, is there a timeline and what is expected to be received by way of resources from neighboring jurisdictions as well as further jurisdictions, correct? Basically, yes. Uh, would you like to comment on that? <coughs> So I, to answer your question, sir, uh, our chief uh, reached out almost immediately once that 7.1 happened. So OES was already involved with that request, uh, and we had uh, at least strike teams coming from Region 5, Region 6, Fresno, LA County, LA City, uh, are all, and Orange County are all sending us uh, USARS task force engines. We already have people here on scene from that county. Uh, that's currently taking place. Uh, we do have more coming, I would say, within the next couple hours. We should expect mass uh, quantities of those people being here. Um, but we've already received uh, outside help uh, um, almost immediately, and they're already here, and they're already in the form of getting ready to complete that, that grid search I was talking to you about um, from earlier. So as far as the fire side of things uh, and mutual aid and support from the state, uh, we have uh, an abundance of people coming. Uh, we currently have a lot of staffing in Ridgecrest ready, uh, prepared, uh, and we're just standing by waiting to address those issues. In terms of resources, we spoke with county officials earlier today in Kern County and they were talking about how you guys really assess when your resources are going to run out and then that's when you guys tap into that mutual aid program. So if you can maybe just bring it for our viewers in Bakersfield right now in terms of what your resources are looking like for the people up here in Ridgecrest for the next 24 hours. 
As far as the staffing levels and things like that, as I stated, so almost immediately following the 7.1, uh, essentially our entire battalion in the desert side was engaged on that. So we had engines uh, already engaged from that. Uh, and like I stated earlier, our chief had already made the phone calls to OES to get that started uh, from uh, outside resources, mutual aid. And then our department, uh, Kern County Fire Department, has already uh, started staffing our stations and callback procedures and like that. So already, immediately, we've had stuff um, already filled, backfilled, and ready for the uh, current mission we have going on. So uh, due to fast uh, uh, actions on part of our command staff, uh, the chief, and then also our mutual aid uh, uh, entities behind us. Uh, we're adequately prepared. I mean, it does have to do with the fact we just had a major earthquake uh, earlier. So uh, we, we actually had resources nearby anyways as a result. So we're, we're ready to go and stop. It's more so food, water, the essentials that the evacuees have been it, talking about and getting that gear for them. Yes, that stuff has trailed in like the chief had stated. Uh, we do already have stuff here, uh, but as uh, the incident is progressing as things digress and get bigger, uh, our, our primary focus right now is Ridgecrest. That, that's where our focus is right now, right? And then as soon as we start addressing that, we start branching out and start uh, not uh, or start to um, identify those secondary resources that may need assistance so as far as logistical needs is water ice you know gate of food stuff like that 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 stuff is happening it's being set up but right now our focus is in the city of Ridgecrest due to the mass population here we're getting word that there may be an evacuation uh, out of Trona. We Let's hold off on that for one moment. The chief of the Ridgecrest Police Department has something that you'd like to interject here real quick. Yeah. As far as resources go for uh, on the law enforcement side, um, we were already staffed. Um, we had a large presence already uh, with the Kern County Sheriff's Department and uh, California City uh, California City PD. They were here. Um, so we were, we were at a level that we felt comfortable with and uh, however when the uh, the quake happened um, Bakersfield PD immediately sent uh, a team um, as well as California City sent additional officers and then the Kern County Sheriff's Department they have uh, they had a wave come in as well so uh, law enforcement wise uh, we are uh, we're sufficient right now and uh, now it's preparing for the future. So what was your other question? Of a pneumonia leak, we're hearing in KTLA that there may be an ammonia leak near Trona from some people who were in contact with there. They say they've been evacuated, they're on the side of the road and there may be an ammonia leak. I have not heard that yet. Um, so your information is probably more updated than mine. We heard there was a mobile home park fire earlier. What kind of damage yes. was done? Um, I have not been out there. Uh, with, okay. Mick has been out there. So. so we have a question about the actual specifics of damage that may have occurred in one of the uh, residential areas here in Ridgecrest. Speak on that. We'll have the chief, uh, battalion chief from Kern County. Yes, ma'am. So as far as the uh, structure fire that we had, uh, we actually had units that were en route to a hazardous condition, but one of our company officers reported a heavy smoke column. They diverted to that. We had a working fire. Uh, they got in it quickly. Um, normally, we're looking at a five engine response, but due to the nature of the um, mass calls we had going on, we actually diverted two engines to it. Uh, had units on scene, aggressive fire attack on it, got knocked on it quickly. We were able to confirm that people inside were okay. Uh, we had all accounted for. There was no injuries. Uh, they were able to protect exposures uh, right by it as well. So as a result, uh, they kept it to the building of origin. Um, and that was the same case with the other secondary structure as well. Due to the abundance of calls, we were only able to cut loose uh, a couple entities, engines to go towards that. Those guys were aggressive, same kind of tactics, protecting, or protecting exposure, sorry. Uh, but they were also effective, uh, and they held to the building of origin. So both instances with structural fires, it was uh, damage was held to the building of origin. Uh, no reported injuries. A civilian or fireside. What Thank about you. the base? Are there, is, are there any? Uh, so we have a question uh, about the base, and we don't have a representative here from the base, so we wouldn't be able to speak on actually what's occurring on the base. At this time, though, we are going to conclude the press conference. All the individuals here will be available for one-on-one -on -one breakouts, uh, so feel free to go ahead and speak to them on whatever individual questions you may have. At this point, we don't have another exact time plan for the next press conference, but we will notify through social media. We will let out a press release as soon as we identify when the next press conference will be held. Thank you for your time. So we have just heard from officials from both the state and from Kern County 
uh, talking about the response uh, and uh, their different responses to it. One, some, some things of note, a call has gone out to the President of the United States asking for an emergency declaration, Governor Gavin Newsom making that request. We don't know yet what the President's response has been, although we do know that FEMA has been activated in Northern mm -hmm. California and their uh, office is responding uh, to this emergency. Okay. And uh, we're going to check in now with uh, reporter Corey James from our sister station KFSN in Fresno. Corey, what can you share with us? And Market Giovanna, we're at the Everidge Market here in River Ridgecrest. Rather, you can see some of the damage that was left behind from that massive tornado that happened this evening. A 7.1. Take a look at this. This is wine bottles all laid out across this aisle here. Most of them on the shelves. You can see where some of them were, and now you can see where they collapsed after that earthquake took place this evening. Now we want to tell you we were here earlier this uh, morning when they had gotten most of this facility, this building uh, cleaned up from Thursday's earthquake and now they're dealing with this all over again and this continues aisle down the aisle. I mean take a look at the next aisle over here Harrison if you can move over to your right there you can see cleaning supplies uh, that also collapsed from shelves here. Uh, the employees who are working in this particular convenience store. Uh, they tell us they spent all day Thursday trying to get the store back up, uh, trying to get it up in operation so that they can start selling things to their customers again. And then they're dealing with this uh, just one day after that earthquake took place. And as we move a little bit farther down, you can see some other areas. You've got Coke bottles uh, that also collapse. Uh, you've got food, uh, some cans that collapse as well, uh, paper towels, just different things, just giving you an idea of how intense that earthquake was this evening. We spoke with a number of people who are out here, some of them getting gas from the gas station because they're not sure if they're going to have to leave town this evening. If something else uh, hits, another earthquake takes place, they just want to be prepared. And you heard the chief there in that uh, press conference is saying to folks, just make sure you are prepared to take care of yourself. That is what we've been seeing from a lot of folks uh, who have been trying to come to this convenience store. They've been standing outside. The owners, they don't want uh, folks in here just for safety reasons, as you can imagine. Uh, but they've been going to the door, uh, collecting money, taking people's orders, if you will, of what they want from the store, uh, cashing them out at the register, giving them their change, and then giving them that merchandise to leave. But this just gives you another idea of how intense this earthquake was. I mean, again, you can see just wine bottles, it looks like alcohol, glass everywhere. Uh, the smell too, uh, if you can imagine a concoction of different uh, alcohols and wine all mixed together. Uh, it's been lingering. The aroma is something that you could smell before you even step inside the building. But uh, this is what we're seeing here at Everidge Market. Uh, and as you can see, it created a lot of damage, a lot of mess. They dealt with this just a couple days ago. One of the employees told me, he said, you know, they didn't have uh, earthquake in so they were just hoping just to be able to recoup, start their operation again today, hopefully make some money, uh, and then within a few hours of being open, here they are again dealing with this once more. And people that we've spoken with here in the town, they said that this earthquake obviously a lot more intense than the last one that happened on Thursday. Uh, many of them feeling those aftershocks. We felt probably about three or four uh, since it happened this evening. But again, as you can see, it has created quite a mess here at this convenience store. Mark Giovanna. All right, cool. Corey James, thank you for that update there from Ridgecrest. Uh, city officials there telling us that there had been two structure fires in that city that uh, warranted a response from the fire department, a quick response, albeit. And uh, we are here. Uh, we understand we have one of our photographers, Martin Orozco, who has arrived at the scene of uh, apparently one of those fires, a burned out structure there. Let's take a look, Giovanna. Uh, yeah, this home we believe is on the 1400 block of Wayne. Uh, again, that's in Ridgecrest, and we believe this is one of the two homes uh, that we heard from firefighters earlier that they had to uh, attack. And uh, the good news is that they were able to fight, uh, you know, get those flames under control uh, fairly quickly, and there were no reports of any injuries, and that they were able to keep those fires contained to the original source, the original home, and they, the, the flames did not spread. And you're seeing an emergency vehicle there. That's a uh, police police or sheriff's department vehicle cruising by. Uh, the presence there is very high. The, uh, the uh, chief of the, the sheriff's department there saying in, in effect they have a lot of resources in there now. They are keeping an eye on everything.
thing, uh, but daylight is going to reveal a lot. That is the challenge. Right now, they don't. They, they talked about situational awareness. They don't have that at this point because it is dark. Mm -hmm. So they don't know the extent of the damage. They don't know uh, the extent of what, what is required to help these folks. And But we did hear uh, from, was it Mayor Beeden also, that the folks Beden. in Ridgecrest, uh, Breeden, uh, are sleeping outdoors this tonight. A lot of folks sleeping outdoors and that is certainly something that happens fairly frequently in the wake of a large earthquake like this no matter what community in Mexico mm -hmm. City it happened back in the 90s and mm -hmm. you know just pretty much you can name the the city that it takes place. People are kind of not trusting necessarily of the structures in which they uh, sleep after uh, dealing with a situation like this but certainly people, not after several quakes. Right. You know, two two days, big ones yeah. in two days. Okay, from uh, San Bernardino County Fire, uh, Jeremy Kern, a captain, uh, is joining us now on the phone. Are you with us, sir? Yes, sir. Okay, can you give us an update from your standpoint? But so right now we have uh, resources deployed out to the Toronto region. Mm -hmm. uh, we have uh, firefighters and specialized trained personnel are going to be uh, going out to the region and looking for damage after this latest event. What have you been able to determine thus far about the extent of damage in Trona? So uh, we do have a, a significant damage after this latest quake. A lot of the uh, highways, and I believe you have some uh, uh, photos that have been circulated widely right now through the news. Uh, the main uh, sections of road that have buckled uh, near the railroad tracks, and there's been a closure that's been established by uh, Caltrans District 9, I believe. And you're referring to Highway 178? Correct. Okay. Um, have, have you been there yourself? And can you tell us, are, is, are there building collapses? Are there, are home, have homes been affected? Are people um, injured? W what have you seen if you've had the opportunity? So initially when, yeah, when this initially happened, uh, our firefighters locally, we live in the community, they went out at immediate hazard assessment. It's a very tight community, a smaller community, about 2,000 people. So they know where their target has are the outdoor population. They immediately went to those areas. And as 911 calls come in, uh, they try to free up about ghastly uh, reports of fire or any large uh, power relay. They did lose power to the region within Trona, so that obviously will complicate efforts as well. Uh, now that we're at time, it's going to slow our progress. As daylight hits, we'll be able to ascertain exactly what type of damage we're at. But we do have. Uh, Increased damage. Uh, what earthquake was prior? We have a lot more block walls set up, uh, buildings which are cracked in their foundation, it mm -hmm. off their their uh, the mobile homes. Um, do you have any numbers on uh, the number of people who have been perhaps transported to a hospital or uh, that required um, assistance, medical assistance? So at this point, there's no reports of any uh, ambulance transports to people that have been uh, directly affected or injured from the quake itself. Mm -hmm. Of course, the uh, calls for service still come in. We have ambulance to, ambulances who have been shipped out to that region, and they are handling the normal day-to-day -day calls when people call for uh, short stress or chest pain or anything like that. Mm -hmm. But nobody's been transported. Uh, we've treated people in the field for minor cuts uh, related to broken glass and things of that nature during the quake itself, but nobody's been transported at this point. All right, it's encouraging to hear talking about calls for service. The 911 system is still up and functioning, right? The phone system, the system by which people can call for help is still working, correct? Uh, correct, at this point, uh, we don't seem to have any issues as far as that goes, but we do uh, advise people that they uh, assess the situation and conditions in their home, if they have an immediate hazard, like I talked about earlier, the gas, the smell of gas, fire, of course, if they need medical attention or treatment, or if they have a power line issue or line sound. Those are something that we want people to call 911 for. We'll triage through our resources who are out there in the field, and we'll get the firefighters to their home to take care of that and the appropriate agency there to mitigate that hazard. So what is your plan for the next several hours? Will, uh, will resources be out on the street working through the night? That's correct. So at this point, we have logistics headed out there. Uh, and actually have been headed out that way all throughout the day. That being fuel for emergency equipment, uh, pallets of water, and any uh, other Gatorade and food. We've been working with the Red Cross to facilitate needs of the community members as well. Uh, throughout the night, what we have is we have our specialized firefighters who are trained in urban search and rescue, structure triage, search techniques, emergency building showing. So if the need arises and they find homes, 
and there's a potential for a trap victim. They have specialized equipment and training. Uh, they can deal with those situations as they come up. Is the damage to Highway 178 affecting your ability to respond to this emergency? No, not at this point. We've still been able to take access uh, in our emergency personnel resources and able to get out of I have a question. You mentioned the Red Cross uh, and, and possible shelters that are open. Are people using the shelters? So uh, as far as the, I don't have any information on the shelter, but the Red Cross is there today, uh, and they're sitting in. So with team members in Red Cross <clears throat> that go need to find where they need to go, whether shelter, place to go, or whether it's water, food, or things of those, uh, those creature comforts where people may not the they their home. All right. Well, uh, thank you very much for spending some time with us. We uh, apologize to our viewers and our listeners for the kind of the spotty nature of the Cell transmission. Phones. But yeah. it, we felt it was vital to try to get as much information as we could. Yeah. We're going to have, uh, we, we have crews on their way heading into Trona. Uh, we're going to have more information from right. there. And uh, Rob McMillan right now is in the city of Ridgecrest. We got an update from there, from officials there. Rob, you're uh, on the ground. What can you tell us from where you are? Well, uh, let's just take a deep breath. I rolled right into town literally two minutes ago. My photographer, Martin Orozco, got here before me and found this home behind me. We're here on the 1400 block of Wayne Street, and we really don't know much about exactly what happened here, except that obviously there was a large fire at this home, and the fire has been extinguished, but uh, this home, which looks like uh, a mobile home, uh, looks to be a complete loss. Uh, from the news, conference that we were listening to uh, from Kern County officials um, within the past 20 minutes, we heard from the fire department that there were two confirmed structure fires here in Ridgecrest at this point. Fire crews were able to uh, get to both locations and put both fires out. Again, two reports of structure fires. As far as damage goes, and that's one thing that uh, obviously a lot of people um, who saw the damage up here in Ridgecrest from the earthquake yesterday, uh, the magnitude 6.4 earthquake yesterday. Uh, most of the damage from that quake seemed to be just property damage and not a whole lot of structure damage. One would expect this quake being a magnitude 7.1. Uh, you heard Dr. Lucy Jones say it sounds about eight times greater than that 4th of July earthquake. One would surmise that there would be uh, much more property damage and much more structural damage uh, from that quake in this one. From what we can tell you right now, uh, we haven't seen it yet. Of course, it's pitch black right now. Uh, from driving into Ridgecrest uh, from the south, you get into town, and this is what I just experienced, and it looks much like you'd expect any uh, city of this size. 25 plus thousand people to be on a Friday night after midnight. Not too many people around. Uh, what activity we saw was at a gas station. Uh, the gas station was open for business and there were uh, quite a few people there gassing up, but uh, not any long lines. As I progressed into town, all of a sudden it went to pitch black uh, because as we've been uh, hearing and as we can now confirm, there are uh, widespread pockets throughout out rich where the power is out. Martin, if you want to just, um, you know, pan that way and you're not going to be able to see much, but that's because the power's out. Uh, pitch black. There goes a guy in a truck right there. Uh, this one of uh, many parts of this town uh, experiencing a power outage tonight. I had text messaged someone who I spoke with at the Walmart parking lot yesterday, and he was freaked out by yesterday's earthquake, as you might imagine, uh, even more so uh, with the earthquake uh, about three hours ago. He says, and the mayor uh, confirmed this in that news conference we were uh, listening to a short time ago. A lot of people uh, are just too scared to be inside right now. They've had all of this shaking over and over and over again, and so they've made the decision to spend the night outside. I was speaking with uh, uh, one transportation official uh, on the way up here, and from what that person told me, uh, some of these streets, it almost seemed like a block party. Obviously, there's nothing fun about what's going on right now, but so many people uh, camping outside. Uh, on this street, I really can't report that. We, we don't see anything here. In fact, it feels like we're all by ourselves. All I can hear right now off in the distance is uh, sirens of emergency vehicles uh, going here and there. Um, anecdotally, 
as I was driving up, I stopped at one of the gas stations to fill up because you never can tell uh, when, you know, there is a small chance of an even larger earthquake. And obviously you're concerned about uh, gasoline and other some of those resources. Uh, I was talking to a cashier and he asked me, he saw the logo and says, are you coming or going or going back and uh, he said that there were at least 30 people in just about an hour span that he says were leaving Ridgecrest. They were heading out of here. They've just had too much of this shaking. Uh, they've had enough of it and they're just going to leave uh, and get to a place where they consider uh, to be safer. Uh, it, it is also very interesting and there are so many stories right now through the greater Southern California area uh, of people hearing, uh, the, you know, the creaking sounds and feeling the earthquake. And I was just talking with the, uh, you know, the pastor at my church saying, you know, all, you know, in Orange County area, it was really rocking and rolling, and there was something that was about to fall off the shelf. Uh, I was in Riverside, and we didn't feel a thing. Um, but again, be that as it may, there are two different sides of this whole equation. You can watch um, all of the scientists look at this from a very antiseptic and, and very scientific point of view and try to explain what the ground is doing and how we really, you know, can't tell too much or put it into too much perspective because this has been going on for millions of years and we only have a small part to look at it. They can look at it from that point of view. But here in Ridgecrest, there's also the, the psychologic uh, factor that, that's going on here. Again, these people are frightened. And, you know, if, if yesterday's earthquake, or I guess now it's what, two days ago, the Fourth of July earthquake was a large earthquake, this is a very large earthquake. We haven't felt an earthquake like this in decades. And, and people here are quite fearful. But uh, from the information we've gathered so far, and again, we'll get much more when, when the sun comes up and, you know, a lot of the uh, uh, first responders and emergency officials can survey the damage and see what it really looks like. I, I would have to say it sounds like uh, because only minor injuries reported and only two structure fires so far, given the fact that this earthquake was eight times stronger, it would look like Ridgecrest has dodged another bullet. Back to you for now. All right. Thank you. Thank you uh, for that report. Thank you. And um, thanks for joining us for Eyewitness News, uh, continuing coverage of the 7.1 earthquake and the many, many, well, 100 aftershocks. Uh, be sure to tune in to Eyewitness News starting at 5 a.m. with live updates from Ridgecrest as the sun comes up. We'll be standing by throughout the night on ABC7 and ABC7.com to bring you any updates as they happen. You can expect more shaking. Stay calm. It should calm down as time progresses. We're all in this together. For the entire Eyewitness News team, we thank you very much for watching. Good night. ABC News, straightforward.